meeting of the Anchorage Assembly to order. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Chair. Ms. Allard? Here. Mr. Peterson? Present. Ms. LaFrance? Here. Mr. Dunbar? Here. Mr. Rivera? Present. Mr. Weddleton? Here. Mr. Constant? Here. Ms. Kennedy? Ms. Kennedy? Here. Thank you. Mr. Presverdia? Here. Ms. Zolotel? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, next, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. If uh, Mr. Michael Mole can come up and lead us in the pledge. And if you can come up to the um, mic here. And then if you could... Um, is, is Mr. Mole in attendance? I heard that he was here in person, but maybe not. All right. So, uh, Mr. Mole, if you're on the phone, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and lead us in the pledge. We can hear you well. Can you yeah. me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Mr. Mole. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next, we have the land acknowledgment. Mr. Constant. Thank you, sir. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement recognizing the indigenous people of a place. It's a public gesture of appreciation for the past and present indigenous stewardship of the lands that we now occupy. It's an actionable statement that marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. The Anchorage Assembly would like to acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Denina Athabascans. For thousands of years, the Denina have been and continue to be the stewards of this land. It is with gratitude and respect that we recognize the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspectives of the Upper Cook Inlet Denina. Thank you. Next, we have minutes of previous meetings. There are none. Next, we have the mayor's report. Madam Mayor. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. This is an exciting moment. With vaccine widely available, we are well positioned to get to a full Alaska summer with the people and activities we love, where businesses are not only open but thriving, friends and family can gather together safely, tourists feel safe visiting, and we're all getting out and enjoying Anchorage together. The governor just moments ago announced that anyone in Alaska over the age of 16 will now be eligible for vaccine. This is a long-awaited milestone after an incredibly long and challenging year, and I'd like to thank the community and the assembly for helping us get to this point. The sacrifices you have made have allowed Anchorage to avoid the worst of this pandemic that many other U.S. cities have endured. Please sign up for a vaccine if you haven't yet and continue to mask up and physical distance to keep yourself and others safe this spring. The actions we take today can get us to a normal Alaska summer. As for the Muni, we'll work to distribute vaccine as quickly as possible. The innovation team will continue to maintain AnchorageCOVIDVaccine.org to make getting appointments easy. We're implementing mobile vaccination teams, teams that can vaccinate people who are unable to leave their homes. We'll set up locations where vaccine access is more difficult, and we will continue to communicate so that residents have the information they need to get vaccinated. We'll remember that a healthy economy depends on a healthy community. We'll listen to the expertise of economists that tell us that the biggest obstacle to our recovery is consumer confidence. Residents and tourists need to feel safe going out to our businesses. With 75% of the community unvaccinated and the existence of more infectious variants, keeping core masking and distancing measures in place will not only prevent another case surge and new variants from getting a hold in the community, they will give residents more confidence to go out, give tourists more confidence to visit, and get us back to that full Alaska summer more quickly. 
Recognizing that no recovery happens overnight, we'll prioritize economic relief, working to find solutions for businesses, and move forward with the projects that will drive economic growth over the summer. Over 16,000 Anchorage residents have applied for a rental relief program, a partnership with Alaska Housing Finance Corporation and Cook Inlet Housing Authority. This will bring over $100 million directly to Anchorage families most in need. And more help is on the way. The next round of federal stimulus that we expect to pass as soon as this week will include more rent relief as well as mortgage assistance. And even as we've responded to the challenges of the past year, we've kept our focus on the future and how we can set Anchorage up for a stronger economic recovery. Last year was the busiest construction year in Anchorage in the last five years, and we're looking ahead to another busy season. The municipality has projects slated across the city that will put people to work and create lasting benefit for the entire community. At the port, the petroleum and cement terminal is scheduled for completion this year. The project employed 80 people over this past summer and is on budget and on schedule. Its completion will mark an enormous milestone in the port modernization project. Anchorage will have a 21st century terminal capable and designed to last for the next 75 years and capable of withstanding earthquakes as large as the 64 quake. The Merrowfield Airport will increase activity with the construction of a new access road, improved snow removal, and new revenue generating property investments. New flight simulators are now open to the public to increase flight training opportunities to get more people working in the air, and new instrument approaches and departure procedures will allow aircraft to take off and land during lower weather ceilings, decreasing the number of canceled flights. Last week, I was one of 100 mayors from around the world asked to participate in the City Lab conference put on by Bloomberg. I got the chance to speak with a mayor from Liga, Latvia, where only 2% of the population has been vaccinated. Connecting with leaders from around the world gave me a personal reminder that we have not been going through this alone. It was also a reminder of how impressive our response has been so far here in Anchorage. I'm incredibly grateful to live in a place that is so ahead of the curve in administering vaccines. And I'm incredibly proud of the progress we've made and look forward to working with all of you for a brighter summer. With that, Mr. Chair, I'd like uh, Mr. Schutte to give us an update on attachment E to EO19 related to organized sports. Mr. Schutte. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Mayor. Um, through the Chair, uh, Chris Schutte, Director of Economic and Community Development. Uh, at the request of the Mayor and the number of Assembly members that wished for some clarification around Attachment E that uh, pertains to organized sports, uh, we wanted to uh, make sure that we could provide uh, Assembly members with an update uh, specific to the pre-competition testing requirements that uh, are in that document and how those apply to teams that wish to uh, travel outside of Anchorage to compete against other teams in uh, other states or cities. So uh, as you saw uh, from the message we provided uh, to the Assembly this morning, uh, trying to summarize the pre-competition testing options that are available for teams and athletes here in Anchorage, uh, there are uh, several options, three options. Uh, ranging from PCR tests through uh, weekly, twice-weekly antigen tests. Um, uh, the twice-weekly antigen test, from a practical standpoint, uh, stands out as a uh, reliable, predictable, and easy to uh, uh, convenient and easy to obtain testing protocol for Anchorage athletes, uh, which would in turn provide them the testing coverage that allows them to compete uh, as much as they would like. Um, both locally and with teams uh, outside of Anchorage, so for teams that wish to travel, for example. Um, there's wording in the current attachment that uh, pertains to teams traveling outside of Anchorage um, that in its current draft uh, seems to state that the teams, the teams outside of Anchorage will also be held to a uh, testing requirement. Um, obviously, that is uh, challenging uh, for us to... Uh, verify and follow, and so the, the language change that we uh, will put forward to clarify that travel requirement uh, will make sure that it's clear that it's the Anchorage teams that 
um, will already most likely be following a pre-competition testing regimen for their local matches uh, or meets will continue to follow that uh, testing regimen and they will be able to travel and compete against other teams without having to verify those other teams have uh, tested as well. Although, uh, depending on where they travel, and uh, those kinds of pre-competition testing requirements may already be in place. Uh, and so I just wanted to provide that update. It was a uh, footnote to the uh, overview that we gave the assembly this morning on the pre-competition testing requirements and wanted to make sure you had the latest news. Uh, with that, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Judy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a question or comment from Mr. Dumber. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll direct this towards uh, Mr. Schutte, if that's all right, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, so, Mr. Schutte, uh, my understanding is that there are some state tournaments happening this coming weekend, and folks are traveling outside of Anchorage, and they are concerned about this particular subsection. Will a new clarifying language be issued this week before this weekend? Uh, through the chair, thank you, Assemblymember Dunbar. So I, I believe the answer to that will be yes, that we can turn around the uh, updated language fairly quickly because it's relatively simple. I guess I should direct that to you, Madam Mayor. You are ultimately the one who makes yes. that call. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> thank you. All right. Next, we have the Assembly Chair's report. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to the assembly meeting, whether you are watching us online, on TV, or attending in person. Thanks to everyone in person for following our COVID-19 protocols, including mask wearing and physical distancing. And thanks also uh, to everyone in person for following our rules of decorum for the chambers. If you need assistance during the meeting, please look for our wonderful aide at the back of the chambers. She'll be able to assist you. For folks who downloaded our agenda or got a copy in person, you'll notice some changes to the agenda. A huge thanks to the clerk's office for developing explanatory statements for different parts of our agenda so that anyone can pick up or download our agenda and understand what's going on. I look forward to continuing uh, to work with my colleagues, the clerk's office, and the public to see how we can keep making it easier for everyone to get involved in their local government. Last, as the members already know and the mayor mentioned, uh, next week um, I'll be announcing a public process for the assembly to consider allocations to local governments included in the American Recovery Act plan of 2021. I look forward to helping lead the body through another, albeit hopefully much quicker, public process to determine the usage of these funds. So look for more details on that early next week. Um, and actually, I just noticed that I missed uh, in, uh, someone in the queue, likely for the mayor's report. Ms. Kennedy, did you want to speak for the mayor's report? Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'm hoping I have my mic issue resolved. You're a little bit soft on our end, but, but I can hear you clearly. Okay. Let me try turning up my own volume and see if that helps. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I did have just kind of a, a point of clarification in regard to the testing for sports teams. And um, so I just want to be very clear that regardless of where our teams go and who they compete with, we are still expecting that those teams will test um, before they go out to those competitions. And then I have another question on a little bit separate issue um, after that clarification. Thanks. Mr. Schutte, are you able to respond? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Chris Schutte, uh, through the chair, Assemblymember Kennedy, if I understood your question correctly, are you asking if, uh, sorry, there's a bunch of phone noise. Um, are you asking if teams that are based within the municipality want to compete elsewhere, will they still be required to test? And I think the short answer to that is the pre-competition testing requirement does apply to Anchorage-based teams that compete uh, here amongst themselves. So they, they still will uh, follow one of the three pre-competition testing requirements, whether that's PCR uh, or, like we stated earlier, the the twice-weekly antigen, which is probably the most convenient. 
um, and that will uh, give them the testing coverage that helps uh, ensure that their athletes are healthy and keeps those teams playing, whether they're playing here locally or they're going to travel outside. Okay, again, I just want the clarification that are we asking our athletes, our sports teams, to test before they go outside to play with other groups in other states? Uh, yes, so through the chair, the pre-competition testing requirement, um, in order to satisfy that so that they can compete locally, uh, we would recommend that they follow one of the three options, number two being the twice-weekly antigen. If they're on a twice-weekly antigen uh, routine or regiment, um, that would cover their testing, uh, whether they chose to play here locally or they chose to play outside. Okay, thank you. But my understanding is we have organizations that don't actually compete within the state and are actually travel or within the municipality and are actually doing all of their competing outside of the municipality. So I just want to make sure that if we have a team that then is using our facilities to practice um, without any other teams involved, that they're not going to be somehow, um, there's not going to be some kind of enforcement against them to not be able to use those facilities anymore should they be competing outside of the municipality, but actually um, uh, then not being required to test. I think this gets very complicated, and that's kind of the reason with my question, um, because I, I, I find it really irrational and unreasonable to require our teams to test when they go out to other locations, knowing there will be other people that are not testing, yet we have held up to that standard of testing when they use, apparently, when they use our facilities for anything, whether that be a competition or just a practice. So um, I'm really trying to find the rational point in that requirement and make sure that our sports teams really understand what is being asked of them, uh, particularly when they are not doing any competitions within the municipality. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move us on to the committee and liaison reports. I'll go ahead and start on this side with Ms. Zalatel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Committee on Housing and Homelessness will meet next Wednesday from 11 until 1230. Um, it is a Microsoft Teams um, event. We're still virtual. Um, we will um, be talking about uh, accessory dwelling units um, and how those are part of the housing strategy within the municipality um, and the housing shortages that um, complicate some of the issues around homelessness. Um, and on this Friday, there is a um, communication subcommittee meeting um, to discuss first quarter budget revision requests. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant? I would just report that <clears throat> this week I am participating in the National League of Cities Congressional Conference and it is quite enlightening about um, kind of all of the national activities that are going on in relationship to COVID response and how to end the pandemic, how communities are responding to economic challenges that they're facing. And it's been very interesting to hear from uh, members of Congress from both parties uh, to hear about their process and dealing with the American Rescue Plan and other matters that are important to Anchorage. So um, I would just report that that's happening. Um, I did hear from that the, the, the bill that was passed out of the Senate will restrict that we can only spend half of the funds in the first tranche and then the rest of the funds in a year later. And so in our process of coming to what we'll be spending funds on in priority to reboot the economy, um, we will have some constraints that are new, but a lot of them that will be less. So it's a very interesting conference, and I'll be sharing some kind of content maybe at a, at a Rules Committee meeting. Thank you. Mr. Perez Verdia? Thank you, Mr. Chair. No update tonight. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, Mr. Chair. No report tonight. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy, and um, feel free if you would like to... Um, Okay, go ahead, Ms. Kennedy. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I can bring that item up again uh, a little bit later in the meeting. Um, it just in terms of a report, the Community and Economic Development Committee did not meet last week due to a lack of a quorum, so we will be meeting, uh, just carrying on with the, the same agenda on March the 18th, and that's just to continue our discussion on um, uh, Title 10 and Title 21 uh, code related to the marijuana licensing revisions. And I do have um, something of, a bit of interest. I don't have a lot of details yet, but the National Association um, of Counties uh, is doing a wildlife mitigation project. And their progr program manager, Jack Morgan, uh, has asked Alaska to participate with that, and I've volunteered to do that. So they're putting together a, just a county leaders working group, and they're not quite uh, formalized yet but just in terms of the kinds of impacts that we have with um, wildfire, um, I um, uh, volunteered to help with that. So as that progresses and we get more details about what it's like, uh, I will let you know and I will also be tapping into some of our um, resources, our, our expertise here within the municipality and maybe in our state for, for helping with part of that project. So I will keep you posted. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton? Uh, nothing to report, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Peterson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Ethics and Election Committee met on February 24th and received uh, a report, a presentation from the Alaska Division of Elections on how their voter database functions. We also got an update on the preparations for the mayoral election, which uh, the ballots will be mailed out on the 15th to people here in Alaska. The overseas ballots were already mailed out earlier uh, this uh, last week. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Zelotel and I co-chair the Health Policy Committee, which met last week. We had a robust discussion of the COVID-19 metrics with the Anchorage Health Department. Um, this was before EO-19 was issued, and at the time, uh, there was st seemed to be strong interest in delving further into those metrics and the question of when the public health emergency is over. I understand there may be a work session scheduled at a later date to further take up these issues. We have asked the administration to brief the Health Policy Committee next month on the COVID-19 transition plan since vaccine testing and mass care all fall under the Anchorage Health Department, it would be helpful to have this discussion in the committee. And second, the Budget and Finance Committee will meet next Thursday, March 18th at 1 p.m. And um, it's a standard agenda so far with a quarterly SAP update included. And if members have any agenda items, please get those to me or Mr. Perez Verdia in the next few days. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Ms. Allard. Thank you, Chair. I don't have anything to report. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we have the addendum to the agenda. Uh, before uh, I do that, though, let's go ahead and go through our late on the table items. So uh, we have uh, three late on the table items. Uh, two of them are supplemental, and then one is an ordinance for introduction. Um, so I, I will go ahead and read all of these in, into the record. Uh, we don't have to take any votes on these ordinances to lay them on the table. Uh, so first is AR number 2021-62S, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing March 2021 as National Women's History Month. Next is AO number 2021-23S, an ordinance determining, determining and approving the total amount of the annual operating budget of the Anchorage School District for its fiscal year 2021-2022, and determining and appropriating the portion of the assembly approved budget amount to be made available from local sources. And then last, it's an unnumbered AO number 2021, an ordinance approving an amount uh, to be made available from local sources for school bond debt reimbursement for bonds passed prior to 2015. The public hearing 
for this is set for March 23rd, our next regular assembly meeting. So those are the three items. No need to take any votes on those. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the addendum to the agenda. Um, Mr. Vice Chair. Move to incorporate the uh, addendum and the laid on table items. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Is there any opposition to the motion? Okay. Seeing and hearing none, then um, those items have been incorporated. Uh, next, we have appearance requests and initial audience participation. So we have one appearance request tonight. Um, and then uh, I'm hearing a little bit of background noise on the phone. So if we can just remember after you speak to please mute yourself again. Um, okay, so next we have uh, appearance requests, initial audience participation. So we have Mr. Louis Embriani uh, for an initial appearance request. Welcome. For the record, my name is Louis Embriani. I have some rhetorical questions that I'll give some background to. And I ask the assembly these questions, and I ask that you keep them in mind when discussing AR 2021-75. I think we can all agree that everyone in our community has the right to feel safe and comfortable. But when does one person or one group's desire to feel safe outweigh another's? When does one person or one group's rights outweigh another's? My answer is never. But that does not seem to be the thinking of the majority of this assembly or the mayor's office, both previous and current. Emergency orders have been issued because they are immediately necessary for the protection of life under Anchorage Municipal Code 3.80.060H. The majority, or the major, emergency orders that have been more restrictive than their predecessor in the last nine months, when they have been, or when have they immediately been implemented? After they were announced, EO15 was implemented almost three days later. EO16 was implemented almost five days later. EO17 was implemented almost four days later. EO18 was implemented almost three days later. EO19 was implemented almost four days later. That's not immediately. When has the mayor been cognizant of and protective of individual civil, civil liberties when implementing these emergency orders as required by Anchorage Municipal Code 3.80.065. The CDC and the Health Department issue guidelines. These are guidelines or recommendations, yet we have made them into laws with the EOs and have threatened Anchorage residents and business to get them to comply with these recommendations. It is the job of our local elected officials to look at those recommendations, evaluate them, then apply them within the rules of our laws and the Constitution. I'll be happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability as to how these EOs have violated legal doctrine and the Constitution. Thank you for participating. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to initial audience participation. Uh, just really briefly, for this initial audience participation, I'd like to prioritize time for members of the public who would like to speak on consent agenda items, those who cannot stay until the second audience participation at the end of the meeting, and those who would have difficulty staying for a public hearing item already on the agenda due to childcare or travel issues before we open it up to the broader public. As a reminder, if you, cho if you choose uh, to speak now on a public hearing item already on the agenda. You may not speak again when we open the public hearing on the item. Also, if you choose to speak now, you cannot speak again during the final audience participation. For audience participation, please direct your comments to the assembly or the chair. You will have three minutes to speak and personal attacks are not appropriate. In addition, audience members are asked to avoid clapping or other disruptions during audience participation. Last, during audience participation, assembly members generally do not answer or respond to comments. We may talk to you offline during a break or after the meeting to address any questions you have. I will, as chair, work to maintain decorum at this meeting and ask for your assistance. With that, like normal, we're going to start with um, three folks on the phone, then three folks in person, and just keep going back and forth until we finish the phone list. 
so uh, let's go ahead and start with Mr. Robert Fairbauer. Hello, you have reached Robert Fairbauer. Please. Okay. Can we try one more time just in case? Hello, you have reached Robert Fairbauer. Next, we have Val McKay. This is Valerie. Hi, Ms. McKay. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on initial audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. I wanted to talk about emergency orders. Please do not extend them. <laughs> I'm not even going to go into the passionate detail I did earlier about S315. I did that earlier today. But the other part of it I really don't want to happen. I do not want anything in Anchorage rezoned right now. Everybody needs to pick up the pieces and do what they're supposed to and get in line first. You don't change something that's okay. You fix things that are broken, and rezoning is not going to fix anything that's going broken in our municipality right now. So I am completely against it. I urge you to please don't do this right now. You've got enough stuff on your plate. Please handle that before moving on to new stuff. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Christiane Schild. Hi, Ms. Schild. Hello. This is, hi, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on initial audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Hi. Um, I didn't prepare as well this time around just because life gets busy. Um, I just wanted to kind of basically talk about the bigger picture. I don't want the emergency orders extended. I don't want them added, I don't want EO-19, the emergency declarations need to be over with. The assembly needs to terminate them now. Um, the bigger picture, I don't see you guys ever looking at the bigger picture. You're taking little agenda items and little things that sound good in theory, but you're not really looking at the bigger picture, what happens later. Um, and I'm just going to do a few examples from tonight. I mean, just off the top of my head. The electric vehicles for our septic, our, um, not septic, our sewer refuse. You want electric, electric cars to pick up our trash, which sounds great, but it's going to cost $1.3 million, and then you need another 300000 for an electric charging station to support them. And then it says you want eventually to have our whole fleet. That's going to be just millions and millions of dollars down the line that sounds great, but it's a waste of money. Priority. We have bigger problems right now. You want the emergency orders to deal with COVID, right? What does that have to do with COVID? What do all these little things have to do with COVID? Even the plastic bags. Sounds great when you think about the environment. We want to get rid of plastic bags. Okay, but now you want to save us from COVID because we're too lazy to wash our own reusable bags, but we're not too lazy to rewash the mask that you want to force us to wear on our faces. These don't make sense when you look at the bigger picture. I really want you to get rid of attachment E on these emergency orders because I know you're not going to listen to me when it comes to getting rid of them. But EO19 is actually more restrictive than EO18, and you're just, you know, putting up a facade, making us think we're getting it a little bit better, and we're not. Attachment E, our kids, you want them to wear masks while they're exercising. 
and it is just ridiculous. Even our professional athletes who are adults don't wear masks when they're exercising. And our kids have a better chance of survival than the adults. You're not looking at the bigger picture, and it makes no sense at all. Um, you're still mandating masks everywhere, even though you say our capacity can be a little bit, a little bit better. You're giving us a little, making us think we're winning at something, and we're not winning at anything. You're, you're getting your way, and you're doing whatever you want, and you don't even care about what, what we think. Um, I don't have a fear of COVID because I actually trust in Christ. I know where I'm going, and I know who my Lord and Savior is. Those people who don't believe in Christ actually think that they can fix themselves. They can be their own God, and they can cure their own bodies with these, own, with these little things that they can do. But you can't. Apologies to interrupt, ma'am, but your time is up. Uh, thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and move to in person. Welcome. Good evening. My name is James Wojciechowski, W-O-J-C-I-E-H-O-W-S-K-I. -E I'm licensed to practice medicine in Alaska as a physician assistant. I live in District 5, represented by Peterson and Dunbar. Good to see you both here. There is no emergency. There's a virus among us, but there's no emergency. The data from the dashboard specific for the Muni, last 30 days, 20 hospitalizations, five deaths. Uh, it's unclear on the dashboard whether those deaths are recent or data mined uh, chart review deaths that could have occurred in the past. Last 14 days, eight hospitalizations, two deaths. Last seven days, three hospitalizations, zero deaths. That does not constitute a public health crisis. Compare to Matsu, no uh, mandates at all. Last 30 days, 14 hospitalizations, no deaths. Last 14 days, three hospitalizations, no deaths. Last seven days, zero and zero. Variants. John Johnston, PhD, brought up the topic of variants at the healthcare committee meeting. And she did neglect, actually, to mention how many cases we have. There's been two of the B117, also referred to as a UK variant, one of the P1 from Brazil. I got those numbers from the CDC website itself, which is where she looks for her recommendations. Uh, those numbers have been unchanged for a month. So the concern about the variant is that it ha is a considered a higher contagion, easier to spread, but it has not shown to create greater hospitalizations or increased death rate. And the vaccines and the immunity from past infection has dem demonstrated protection from these variants. Case counts. 10 per 100,000 is a number that seems to keep coming up as a benchmark that we should be looking at. I'd like to point out that that was uh, compiled in July of 2020 by the Brown School of Public Health. That was long before vaccines. Uh, our seven-day average case count, if you look at the seven-day average case count of the states that have already completely opened up, it runs between 26 and 7.8. There was only one state that's opened up that is below 10 per 100,000. So it doesn't look like their experts are agreeing with ours. Also at present, if you take the amount of past infections added to the amount of people immunized here in the Muni, we're sitting at a rate around 51% herd immunity, which is outstanding. And if you look at people over 65, their vaccination rates are 63%. It's been that on the dashboard for two weeks now. So I suspect there are people that wanted to get a vaccine the rest are either waiting or not going to. It's long past time to admit it. There's no emergency. Let's just do away with those orders and open up. Thank you. Welcome. Fixed it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Charles McKee, and uh, I'm uh, presenting myself. I, I Charles McKee, a de jure private civilian. 
American national, executed without the United States, not a resident of the state of Alaska, nor a U.S. citizen, 14th Amendment individual, and not pro se or representing myself. I'm a man. I am a man. Simply that. Therefore, the trust that the state of Alaska owns, I'm a beneficiary of, based off my birth certificate. So when I went to court, which you sponsored because of Jack Frost and the call he received from the governor's office, the current governor, which, by the way, advocated reducing the population of Alaska down to the 1960s when he was down in Ketchikan before the, the, assemb before the assemblage of people there before he even got elected, before COVID. So, therefore, he comes after me in retaliatory fashion because I killed his bill, the House of the Fish Tax Bill, April the 25th at LAO, statewide teleconference, in front of Bert Stedman, the senator, chairing the committee. Eight days later, my landlord gets a call from Jack Frost. He also gets a notice from the code enforcement. While they're holding my $113,000 so I can pay rent, I get evicted. It's all because of now I'm facing charges in court of reckless endangerment. To this day, it's up on, on the computer that I'm being charged for class two felony. I had it reduced when I went before the judge to a misdemeanor. But it's not posted like that. And when I presented myself to the judge, I said, Your Honor, I have here a notarized signature as to who I am. I'm the beneficiary of the McKee Trust. You, on the other hand, are my trustee, and your clerk is the other trustee, and the state of Alaska is a prosecutor. He is a bringing the controversy and carrying the liabilities. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dustin Sherman, for the record. <clears throat> I'm here tonight to for a couple different things, but I'm going to start off with I'm in here. I'm here in support of AR 2021-75. Um, like many of the others that have testified tonight, I think that we do need to just end the emergency proclamations. The second thing that I'm here is this week, this whole last week, or whenever your agenda came out, I've been getting questions on a couple different things. Uh, the ombudsman put out a uh, a, <coughs> a memorandum for. You guys are going to be changing your designation from, um, you're, you're going to be becoming the legislative branch or executive branch. And part of what the Ombudsman states is that it takes 11 members of the assembly. And a lot of people don't understand exactly how that's working considering one of the members is now acting mayor. So I don't know if there's anything that you guys can put out or you guys can answer a question on that. Do we or do we not have 11 members of the acting assembly or do we not? So that's become kind of a, a question that's been going around Anchorage here the last couple of days. So uh, if somebody could answer that, that would be great. Also on the travel restrictions for the sports teams, um, I, I just want to, so I'm going to be making a trip down to San Diego here at the end of the month to get my eyes worked on. And there's literally zero travel restrictions for me to go down, come back. They suggest that I should quarantine or I should get tested, things like that. But it's not a, a hard, solid mandate or anything like that. My question would be, like the teams that I have that are going down to Bowl Nationals, why is it that they have to be pre-tested before they leave? And they're not going to be coming in contact with anybody. They're not, it's not a wrestling team. It's not a hockey team. They're not going to be having contact sports, nothing like that. And... 
I think that if they were to go come back and maybe quarantine for a few days, make sure that they're not sick, I think that would be a better recommendation rather than testing down there. They're going to, they're going to be going to Ohio uh, for nationals, and I don't think that they're going to be testing down there. So that might be something that uh, you guys might consider. I don't know if you guys can do anything on that or not, but uh, I think that the testing uh, going out of state may be a little bit, needs to be a little bit more, I guess, uh, specific to, to what kind of sports they are, I guess. That's all I got. Thanks. Thanks. I have a question for you uh, Mr. from Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Sherman, right here. Yes. So the, um, you know, the, the state mandate failed even though the governor requested it be extended, the emergency declaration, because the legislature couldn't organize. So now the things that were mandatory became uh, suggestions, as you said. Um, my old hometown of Cordova has a, a very large outbreak right now where a lot of people are quarantined because the police chief traveled, caught COVID, came back, didn't follow the town's quarantine recommendations, and went and coached his wrestling team and infected a, a number of people. Um, so I guess my, my question for you is, now this is, it's not mandatory, but I'm curious just personally, you, you're going to go to San Diego when you come back. Do you plan to get tested, to quarantine? Um, just I know you, you, you've been very involved in these issues. I'm curious what your plan is, because it's not mandatory, but we're hoping people will voluntarily do what people consider to be the right thing. I'm curious what your plan is. Well, honestly, since I work with the public and I see the public every day and they're in my face, I will probably get tested. But that's not, that's not going to be everybody. Sure. I mean, every, you know, everybody's got their own feeling. Keep in mind, I've already had COVID, so I know the whole process. Okay? I ended up okay with COVID. I don't want to give it to someone else. But if I'm, in, if I'm out there dealing with the public, I don't want to give it to my customers. I have a lot of older people that bowl for me or bowl in my center. So... Yeah, I mean, if I come back and, and I decide I don't want to quarantine, I will get tested. But at the same time, if I decide I want to quarantine, that's the route I'll go. Mm -hmm. So there's two options. Right. And that's the way I believe that the sports team should have is options. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and try uh, Mr. Fairbauer one more time. Hello, you have reached Robert Thurbauer. Okay. All right. Welcome. My name is Chris Tyree. I am 66 years old. I have not worn a mask the whole year. I have not gotten COVID. I'm not scared of it. My God is not a God of fear. I don't think about the COVID. I think about the things that you guys are doing that are treasonous to me as a human being in America. All of you are a corporation, an artificial entity. You are under maritime admiralty law, not constitutional. We, the people, are under the Constitution. Corporations have no force and effect of law on any one individual. You may try to do that to your employees if they allow you. Maritime admiralty law makes the individual chattel. Under this law, the chattel, which is merchandise, is lost, stolen, or dead. Again, no force and effect of law on an individual. We as individuals are man and woman, living, breathing, walking beings. This is why the media, the schools and corporations are pushing gays, lesbians, transgenders, etc., to effeminize the masses for control and domination and power. And I am not against gays. What I'm against is schools pushing it from the time of child's in kindergarten, which is going on right now in the lower 48. It's up to an adult to decide for themselves what they want to do. The true intent and definition of corporation is corpse, which is a dead body, oration, a fantastic speaker. So you have a lawyer propping up a dead body. Incorporated means trying to put life into that dead body. This is why you are a team member, not an individual. Individualism is not allowed in a corporation. You can shame one individual via a team to program all. The flu, alias COVID. Alias COVID, an economic scam to bankrupt the governments of the world, make more monies for big box stores, shut down small businesses, and introduce more socialism and communism. Treasonous. Alias COVID is a scamdemic for social engineering, social programming, and social experimenting. 
alias COVID masks are what the child traffickers used as they raped, tortured, and killed children, when, women and men, and boys. Being they worship Satan, this is a thrill for them because the sheeple are robots. They laugh at the ignorant government personnel that push these unconstitutional mandates. We do not have to follow. It is not law. You have no jurisdiction on this matter over us, only government employees if they allow. You are also liable for damages upon, upon our children's health. 35% of adults will have throat cancer in the future. Sovereigns do not have to give up their sovereignty to any agency. This is law. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar? Ms. Tyree, I have a question for you. Yes. Why? I'm, I'm curious about your logic here. Why do you think we're under maritime law right now? Uh, because that's what you are. You're, you're not do, doing constitution. Uh, the lawyers know this. Talk to the lawyer. Talk to the attorney. He knows. And you're also violating 18 U.S.C. section 241 and 242 and 42 U.S.C. 1983 under color, color of law, color of state law, under all kinds of color. Because you guys are not supposed to do anything unconstitutional to the people. And that's the law. And your attorney knows. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Constant. I also have a question. Yes. One more quick one. Do you believe that corporations are people? No. Something we agree because on. It's Thank you. people running it, not one. I agree with you. So, and that's why the Supreme Court had a hard time with making their law on that. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Ready? Thanks. I am Sammy Graham, and I was born and raised in District 1. I am not represented. I am a retired principal. I have a Master of Ed Leadership and a Master of Science in Counseling. As a nation, we should be judged not by how we treat our elites, but how we treat our most vulnerable, our elderly, our disabled, our unborn, and especially especially our children. Anchorage has spent more than a year in quarantine, one year where our businesses have closed, our relationships have dissolved, and our children have suffered. With no real opportunities for in-school socialization, kids have become depressed, withdrawn, and even suicidal. They are wondering if normal will ever return. Former, former outgoing high schoolers and laughing elementary students spend their days staring at computer screens and spending their nights gaming, a very unhealthy substitute for real interactions. We would be foolish to think this change has not affected our children negatively. The problems are all around us and often they manifest themselves in drastic, disturbing and heartbreaking ways. For a state where suicidal rate was already shockingly high, the pandemic and the assembly's lockdowns have drove those numbers up even more. And even one death is too many. It's heartbreaking, and it cannot stand. Too many of the city's children have stared down the barrel of a gun or at a bottle of pills after weighing their options and coming to an agonizing decision that they had no hope their life simply wasn't worth living anymore. And when you consider what they have to look forward to, a hazy future filled with more lockdowns and perpetual fear of an amorphously dangerous virus, it's easy to understand their point of view. No child should ever make that decision, nor should any adult. It's worth considering how this lockdown, your lockdown, has affected our elderly, our sick, our students. These lockdowns have been hell on populations that were vulnerable. We've repeatedly asked ourselves, is the cure worse than the disease? The answer, after looking at the scientific data that you, ask, you keep asking us to follow, it now appears, is a resounding yes. There is absolutely no reason that schools have stayed closed under your mandates. ASD is now making a step in the right direction, with secondary students returning to in-person learning. They need to interact and smile at their teachers and their friends and practice with their teams on the ice or the field. No lockdown is worth a parent coming home to find their child dead, and yet your lockdown caused that exact experience. Are we doing the right thing? Are we making the decision better or worse? We can do better. Thank you. 
Thank you. I have a question for you from Ms. Allard. Hi. Can you just tell me your educational background? Just two of your last roles that you played or were? I was principal at a private school, and before that I was principal at an elementary school here in the district. Yep, and counselor before that. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Tiffany Quirk, and I'm a resident of Eagle River. Jamie Allard represents uh, our community, and I want to tell you her and the rest of you, thank you uh, for the job you're doing. I know it's hard, especially during this time. Um, I thank you for allowing me to present my testimony and speak today to voice my concerns and reasons why I and many Alaskans strongly oppose any and all current and future COVID emergency orders and why we strongly ask for your vote of approval for AR 2021-75. For the past year, the numbers related to COVID have been abundantly sh been shared in these meetings, on the news, and within the emergency orders that have been issued. Whether that's the hospital numbers, the current COVID cases, the deaths, or how many people have been tested. Everything has surrounded around numbers. So I want to talk to you this evening about some numbers. Currently in the state of Alaska, as of March 9th today, we've had 305 deaths of persons that have died with COVID. Our state is not in a defined credible threat or disaster, nor are our hospitals overwhelmed. In fact, it's, it's the exact opposite with less pods being operated at the hospitals and many nurses have been laid off due to there not being enough work. The number one thing to look at as a qualifier of credible threat or disaster and whether or not to extend the emergency orders is the death rate in Alaska. After all, this is why we enacted these orders in the first place, to preserve the loss of life or at least allude to the people that this was the concern and the reason for shutting our state down and to continue on with these emergency orders. The death statistics for Alaska on the Department of uh, Health and Social Services website for 2018 for accidental deaths, which is the most recent information. There were 397 accidental deaths. I ask you, did we tell people they couldn't go fishing for fear of drowning? Did we tell them they couldn't operate a plane for fear of an aviation accident? Did we tell them they couldn't drive their motor vehicle? Did we tell them they couldn't get in their boat and go to Prince William Sound? No, we did nothing of that. But we had almost 100 more COVID deaths, or I'm sorry, 100 more accidental deaths in 2018 than we have from COVID. Um, furthermore, we've had over 300 accidental deaths each year since the year 2000. So 21 years, we've had over 300 accidental deaths. My, let me remind you, we've had 305 COVID deaths, okay? Furthermore, the death statistics um, for suicide in Alaska for 11 months in 2020, we had um, close to 300 suicides just in 11 months. So again, the same amount of deaths regarding COVID. Um, it's time to end this. Uh, you get what you ask for. And if you guys continue on with this, the World Bank has that this will be going until 2025. So I again urge you that this needs to end. And uh, we... I always said we need to take care of our children and those are who are going to take care of us in the future. So we need Thank to open you. up our state. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Irene Quidnow. Um, I'm in district, Sand Lake district. Um, Cameron Paris Verdia is my representative. And then there's the empty seat. Um, an emergency is an unforeseen event. We don't have an unforeseen event anymore. Um, we have had a year to deal with this. There is no emergency anymore. And I've testified before, the only reason why you want to extend the emergency orders is because you, because you want to keep the money and get more money and you want to keep the power. And that's not a reason for emergency orders and I urge you to not um, extend any of it and revoke it all. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Welcome.
Apologies. And just to be clear, um, so you will be our last individual speaking for initial audience participation. If anyone else would like to speak, you'll uh, please either stay here for the end of the meeting, or if you won't be here, uh, please sign up for phone testimony for the final audience participation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark Nussbaum, for the record. Um, Cameron perez Rodia is my assembly representative. Um, you know, I, I don't usually speak in the opening. I, I wait until the end. Um, and I had something written, but I, I'm going to go a different way tonight. So I was just hoping to bring to the body's attention this evening um, through the phone testimony and the in-person so far. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And I get it right, I've brought this up before, the, the lack of attention that's being paid to the speakers. I think I brought it to your attention last time that you guys recognize the Seawolf Hockey, uh, save the Seawolf Hockey group. They approached the podium to give you thanks for that recognition and nobody paid attention to that speaker. Your first, uh, well, all, all three of your phone testimonies this evening um, didn't get any attention in person. Um, uh, Dunbar constant Zalatel, no attention paid at all. And I know you guys have things that you're you're probably looking up when people say something. You might look something up. Um, I see a lot of crosstalk. Somebody starts talking. You guys are leaning over, talking to each other. You know, you guys want respect from us. You want a civil uh, assembly here coming to you and asking questions. Well, you don't want any of us asking questions. But you want to hear from us, but you don't want to pay attention to us. Peterson, I'm glad to see you here tonight. Dunbar, you're, you're here. Chris, you're here. That's good. Um, I see you guys taking turns now. That was a conversation that I had with, um, with Cameron. Uh, you know, at first we thought you guys were choosing to stay home. He made it clear that you guys, through social distancing efforts and, and COVID uh, recognition, you guys are kind of thinning the, the herd a little bit. I asked for maybe some... Uh, turn taking. I know Felix, you're here because you're the chair, acting chair. Um, Miss Allard, you're here all the time. I appreciate that. But um, you know, when when people are up here giving their time after a work day, or maybe not, um, just if you could just spend the three minutes looking. I know you guys have heard the same shit over stuff over and over, right? But that doesn't mean that any of us are less important than what you got going on behind there. This is public testimony. Or this is time that's set aside to pay attention to us. And so I would really, really appreciate it if I could see some eye contact with the people at this podium. Some people are speaking to subjects that maybe you guys should be taking some notes and writing some things down to look into it for yourselves. Maybe something makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like, actually, never mind, that is the end of our initial audience participation. So if anyone else would like to speak during final, please uh, either stay till the end of the meeting or sign up with the clerk. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to the consent agenda. Cons Consent agenda items numbered 10A through 10F are typically routine or non-controversial items, such as bid awards, new business, information and reports, and ordinances and resolutions for introduction. The items on the consent agenda may be approved by the assembly by a single vote on a motion to approve the consent agenda. Prior to approval, items may be pulled by an assembly member for discussion and separate vote on each of those items. Under the assembly rules of procedure, all ordinances and some resolutions will have an opportunity for public hearing on a future date. With that, we'll go ahead and go down the dais and see what members would like to pull. I'll start on this side with Ms. Allard. Nothing, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to pull one item, 10A1 for reading. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No items this evening. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton. Uh, 10B1. 
Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to pull item 10, Delta 10, item 10, Echo 4, and item 10, Foxtrot 3. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to pull item 10, Alpha 2 for reading. Thank you. Mr. Perez Verdia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No items to pull this evening. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Uh, I would like to pull item 10A3, and I would actually like to request that we consider a work session for item 10G3, which is appointments to ACDA with the purpose of hearing from ACDA, just kind of current status and updates what they're up to, and some conversation about equity in their board. Okay. But I don't want to pull that item. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Constant, I mean, excuse me, Ms. Zalatel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to pull item 10G3 um, and the unnumbered AO that was laid on the table. Got it, thanks. Uh, the clerk advises me that that will be item 10G6. Okay, let me go through the list. So I have items 10A1, 2, and 3, 10B1, 10D10, 10E4, 10F3, and 10G3 and 6. Are there any other items? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair? Um, move to um, adopt the as a consent agenda, uh, less the pulled items. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda with the exception of the pulled Thank items. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Is there any opposition to the motion? Okay, seeing none, that motion is approved. So for the public's information, the assembly has now passed or accepted all items in 10A through 10F, other than the items that were just pulled, which we will take up next, or that have been introduced for a future public hearing, which are all the items in 10G. If you are here to see action on an item listed on the consent agenda that was not pulled, those items have been passed or accepted. So I'm gonna go ahead and start going through the pulled items, starting with 10A1, resolution number AR 2021-62, resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing March 2021 as National Women's History Month. What is the will of the body? Move to approve the S. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Uh, is there any opposition? Seeing none, that item is approved. Who's reading and who's presenting? I'm reading, Mr. Chair. This is Ms. LaFrance. And I'm presenting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Go ahead. AR number 2021-62S, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing March 2021 as National Women's History Month. Whereas growing out of a small town school event in California, Women's History Month is a celebration of women's contributions to history, culture, and society and the United States has observed it annually throughout the month of March since 1987. And whereas the annual theme this year, Valiant Women of the Vote Refusing to be Silenced, extends the 2020 focus honoring the brave women who fought to win suffrage rights for women and for the women who continue to fight for the voting rights of others. And whereas from legal defense and public education to direct action and civil disobedience, women have expanded the American tradition of using inclusive, democratic, and active means to reduce violence, achieve peace, and promote the common good. And they have given voice to the unrepresented and hope to victims of violence. And whereas many organizations and individuals in Anchorage and all of Alaska embody this theme by participating in progressive social change movements, serving in the U.S. military, providing services to those in need, educating, and being public servants, and whereas in the municipality we recognize and celebrate women in our local community 
who have broken barriers in the past and present with accomplishments, elevating us all and inspiring a new generation of leaders. Dr. Lydia Selcraig, first woman having served on the Anchorage Assembly, Jane Anvik, first woman having served as chair of the Anchorage Assembly, Aura D. Clark, first woman to serve as the superintendent of the Anchorage School District, Acting Mayor Austin Quinn Davidson, first woman serving as the mayor of Anchorage, Chief Jody Hetrick, first woman serving as the Anchorage Fire Department Chief, Interim President Pat Pitney, first woman serving as the president of the University of Anchorage, Alaska, President Valerie Nararaluk Davidson, first woman serving as the president of Alaska Pacific University, Colonel Patricia Sank, first woman who served as the base commander at J-Bear, Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson, and Colonel Christina Aguilar, who immediately succeeded Colonel Fink as the second woman to serve as base commander at J-Bear. Whereas during March, events take place to celebrate Women's History Month, including the Women's History Month Community Conversation held on March 7th at 7 p.m. via Zoom, hosted by the Alaska Black Caucus, an organization that promotes the lives of African Americans and other members of the BIPOC community. The Women's History Month membership program on March 27th at noon via Zoom, hosted by Business and Professional Women North to the Future, NTTF, an advocacy organization for women, children, and families, which provides educational scholarships to economically challenged Anchorage youth. Now, therefore, the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizes March 2021 as National Women's History Month and encourages our community to participate locally in programs, ceremonies, and activities celebrating the contributions of women to our rich history. Passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this ninth day of March, 2021. Ms. Zolotel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a few comments on this resolution um, and why it's an S version. I really think that when we do these recognition resolutions for um, Women's History Month, Black, you know, Black History Month, any of these things, we really need to ground them in the history of our own community, past and present. And so recognizing those leaders who are um, breaking barriers um, right now and in the past um, and, and enshrining those in our public record, I think is really important. So um, I reached out to a lot of the women named in this resolution. And as you can imagine, they are all very busy. So they all send thanks. Um, and I just hope that uh, you all take the opportunity to uh, reach out and get to know them if you don't. Um, but I know many of you um, do know them. and. Um, really just um, celebrate their achievements. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have item 10A2, resolution number AR 2021-64, resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing Jane Angvik and Vic Fisher as the recipients of Congregation Beth Shalom's 2021 Shining Lights Award. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any opposition? Seeing none, that item is approved. Who's reading and who's presenting? I will be reading. Is uh, someone here to receive it? I think uh, Mr. Peterson has a presentation copy. Okay, well, I will, be, I will be reading it at any rate, and I know that there will be a Shining Lights Awards uh, where hopefully they can get the uh, signed version. Whereas Jane Angvik was raised in Minnesota and after earning a BA in urban studies and an MA in public administration from Harvard, she moved to Alaska in 1973 to work as a community planner for the greater Anchorage area borough before being hired by the Alaska Federation of Natives. And whereas Jane was elected to the Anchorage Charter Commission and was later elected to the Anchorage Assembly where she served as the first female assembly chair. Jane has worked for three Alaska governors and her achievements and service have been recognized by her induction into the Alaska Alaska Women's Hall of Fame, the Athena Society, and as a YWCA Alaska Woman of Achievement. And whereas, Vic Fischer was born in 1924 in Berlin, Germany, and spent his childhood there and in Russia. After serving with the U.S. Army during World War II, Vic graduated from the University of Wisconsin and earned a master's in city planning from MIT. 
Vic moved to Alaska in 1950 and worked in town site planning for the Bur Bureau of Land Management before becoming Anchorage's first planning director and being elected as a delegate to the 1955 Alaska Constitutional Convention. And whereas in 1966, the University of Alaska selected Vic to lead the university's new Institute of Social and Economic Research. As a state senator in 1981 to 86, Vic's priorities were women's rights, reducing domestic violence, and policies to support the poor and the vulnerable. Vic continues to be an optimist who believes community engagement can and will change the world. And whereas Jane and Vic continue to be actively engaged in public policy issues as they put into practice their basic values, respect for individual rights, opposition to discrimination, and empowering those on the fringes of our society. Now, therefore, the Anchorage Assembly recognizes Jane and Vic and Vic Fisher for the, their embodiment of the spirit of Tikkun Olam and as the 2021 recipients of the Shining Lights Award. Passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this 9th day of March, 2021. Thank you, and we'll make sure to get a copy to uh, Beth Shalom. Um, next, we have item 10A3, uh, resolution number AR 2021-65, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing March 2021 as Brain Injury Awareness Month. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any opposition? Seeing none, that item is approved. Who's reading and who's presenting? I'll be reading. Okay, great. Resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing March 2021 as Brain Injury Awareness Month. Whereas March is National Brain Injury Awareness Month, a time to recognize the prevalence of brain injuries and help make lives better for individuals who have sustained this kind of trauma. And whereas traumatic and acquired brain injuries can happen to anyone and can bring a lifetime of co-occurring conditions, including persistent concussion symptoms, PTSD, physical impairment, developmental delays, paralysis, cognitive or behavioral problems, suicidal thoughts, greater risk of dementia and Alzheimer's, and lifelong challenges for individuals and families. And whereas, these injuries are often preventable, and the incidence of identified traumatic and acquired brain injuries in Alaska is significantly higher than the national rate, and the long-lasting effects of COVID-19 may include neurological and cognitive symptoms, which may improve with brain injury rehabilitative strategies. Policymakers have a responsibility to promote community safety and brain injury prevention through person-centered policies. And whereas brain injury may contribute to homelessness, substance and alcohol misuse, criminal behavior, domestic violence, and mental and behavioral health disorders, but with access to updated education, assessment, support, care, and treatment regarding the brain's neuroplasticity, Overall quality of life can greatly increase and individuals may be able to return to their community of choice, decreasing overall costs of care. And whereas global projects such as unmasking brain injury seek to give survivors a voice, promote brain injury awareness and education, and eliminate stigma by showing that persons living with brain injuries are deserving of dignity, respect, compassion, and full integration into their communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Anchorage Assembly that March 2021 is recognized in the municipality of Anchorage as Brain Injury Awareness Month, and the people of Anchorage are encouraged to further pu public awareness of the effects of brain injuries, the importance of preventing brain injuries, and to observe Brain Injury Awareness Month with appropriate programs and activities, passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this ninth day of March 2021. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Annette Alfonsi, and I am the Alaska Partner for Unmasking Brain Injury, an international brain injury awareness project. Alaska is the only unmasking partner that is led by a volunteer individual instead of an organization. Thank you all very much for this resolution today, as I know you're very busy. Um, I've spoken with groups that have a high amount of clients with brain injuries in vulnerable populations, including social services and nonprofit groups. 
Directors know their clients have brain injuries, that they are often the first point of contact for clients, but they said, said that they are not motivated to learn about brain injury or add it to their intake or programs because it is not tied to funding for client services. So they're contributing to misdiagnosis, mismanaged medication, and not supporting their clients' independence. They don't recognize sometimes a behavioral or mental health symptom is linked to a physical brain injury, and treating the brain injury would resolve the behavioral symptom. And frankly, I'm tired of these groups asking you for more money while they ignore brain injury, which has been described as a public health crisis. Uh, so I'd like to suggest two ideas today to this esteemed body. First would be to link municipal funding to brain injury education for people that have direct client interaction, including municipal departments like police, fire, education, health, and vocational rehabilitation. I know that's a lot. These groups focus on function and need to understand the client symptoms they're witnessing. I know program directors and social service groups that love this idea. And if they don't want to do it, they don't need municipal funding. And second is to create or support a housing unit specifically for brain injury, the way other housing units exist for people with specific diagnoses. This would allow tailored environmental modifications for hypersensitivity and neural fatigue, and would be great for group therapies, peer supports, and individualized treatments. And I know directors that love this idea also. There are statewide conferences, education, and programs around reducing recidivism, trauma-informed care, and homelessness and housing, and there are new rules and regulations around opiate medications. We decided as a group that we care about these topics and we did something about them. We need to decide that we also care about brain injury and then do something about it. There's a place for everyone in our community, even after experiencing a head injury. People who have experienced brain injuries are in every facet of life, including healthcare, essential services, middle management, leadership, directorship, and government. I like to joke, we're everywhere. This invisible and often chronic health issue changes lives, but it doesn't have to destroy them. And it starts with awareness. So thank you very much for your time and for this resolution today. Thank you. Mr. Rivera. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks so much for coming today. So I'm wondering if you could email those two suggestions, because I wasn't able to write down all of those details. If you can send that email to all of the assembly, that would be really helpful. And then um, I really appreciate it. There was an individual who emailed us. I don't remember her name, but she had some also detail there and a, and a really great story, uh, which you know, I think is really helpful to tie those stories to the experiences and how we develop our policy. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Yeah, it's super important to listen to content experts, and often people think that PhDs are the content experts, but they're the academic experts. Those of us with lived experience are really the content experts. So thank you so much for recognizing that. Thank you. All right. Um, before I go on with our next consent agenda item, uh, Mr. Constant. Thank you. Briefly, I want to address a resolution that we passed on the consent agenda, but I didn't bring up for reading just for purposes of time. Uh, in two days, really tomorrow, because of the dateline, will be the 10th anniversary of the earthquake, the great eastern Japan earthquake and tsunami that struck and killed some 15,000 people. And um, Anchorage has a strong connection with uh, one village and city, Rikuzen Takata, uh, where Monty Dixon, a UAA student, died in the event, one of two Americans. And so we will be commemorating uh, the creation of the Monty Dixon Center at UAA the, and also uh, meeting with the leadership of the, the city of uh, Rico Zentakata, of course, online. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that we spoke briefly to the fact that uh, what we resolve in the resolution is that we'll remember the loss of life heroism and the amazing reconstruction and that our cities shall forever have a special bond. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to recognize Ms. Salatel for a moment of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to recognize that March 18th is Transit Driver Appreciation Day. We did not do a resolution, but um, and in our next meeting is after that day. Um, have you thanked a bus, your bus driver or bus operator lately? They drive in difficult weather conditions, stay calm and collected in challenging situations, start early in the morning and keep us safe late at night and on the weekends. People Mover carries millions of riders each year. 
So I think um, our transit operators deserve a shout out. Um, apologize for not doing a resolution, um, but thank you for the opportunity to um, recognize them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Alatol, and yes, thank you to all of our uh, transit drivers. You're greatly appreciated. Okay, next item we have is 10B1, a AR number 2021-75. A resolution of the Anchorage Assembly regarding the Mayor's Proclamation of Emergency and the Mayor's and Acting Mayor's orders and regulations issued thereunder. Uh, what is the will of the body? Um, moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Weddleton, you pulled this item. Did you want to speak on it before the amendment? Um, well, I have an amendment to make or to offer. So I'd start with that. I'd like to amend it by checking on page 2, line 45, box 7 under EO 19 regarding organized sports. And as part of that, I would like to delete on attachment E, page 3, the second bullet regarding organized sports teams playing outside of the municipality. And I can read that. I'd like to delete from attachment E the bullet that says, organized sports teams located or based in the municipality of Anchorage are allowed to attend meets, competitions, tournaments, or otherwise travel outside the municipality for practice or competition, provided all participants in the competitions complete pre-competition COVID testing as described below. Thanks, Mr. Whittleton. Uh, can I get a second and then I will ask for clarification? Second. Thank you. Second. Um, so, Mr. Weddleton, just to be clear, um, so what you are doing, is you are seeking to delete a specific provision in attachment E and not the entire attachment itself? Correct. Okay. Do you need it one more time? Okay, great. Um, could you just repeat that section? Um, because we don't have the attachments themselves. So if you, if you could just repeat it one more time, please. I'd be happy to. So this is um, Emergency Order 19, Attachment E, which is titled Organized Sports. And on page 3, the second bullet, uh, delete the second <coughs> bullet that reads, Organized Sports Teams located or based in the Municipality of Anchorage are allowed to attend meets, competitions, tournaments, or otherwise travel outside the municipality for practice or competition, provided all participants in the competitions complete pre-competition COVID testing as described below. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and go in the queue for um, discussion on this amendment. Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have a question to the mover of the amendment and then to the administration. So this is precisely the provision that the administration said that they were going to be changing this week. And so my question to the member is, did, I, I, I don't know if, if that all came through and, and does that change your, your thinking, Let me start, does that change your thinking on, on removing that provision? And w why would you remove it if they've agreed to, to change it? Um, Mr. Chair, should I go? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Weddleton. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, you know, it does, um, I don't think this says what they meant and they've, sounds like they will reword it so it says more what they meant because the way it reads now is that if you go to another event outside of Anchorage, everyone at that event, even from other cities, and if you perhaps went to a hockey tournament in Arizona, everyone at that tournament would have to follow Anchorage's rules, which is, you know, simply absurd. I think it's just a, you know, miswording here. And it sounds like they will fix that, which is a good thing. But it is um, still, I, I think this is a, problem, and I'm not sure why it's here, that our teams would, um, if they go to Matsu, which has no controls and, and lots of COVID, um, would test before they go, presumably to protect the people there, which is kind, um, but then come back. Um, would they, you know, it just seems odd. Why would they do that? If I want them tested, I'd want them, if they go to Arizona or something, just follow the normal um, recommendations for traveling outside 
you know, the state. You know, I'm outside of the state now. We tested before we left. We tested today. And we'll quarantine and test when we get back. I mean, that makes sense in the thought process of preventing the spread of the virus. How this testing of everyone on the team went before they leave um, helps not spread the virus, certainly in Anchorage, is, is puzzling. I, I just don't see the connection. And, and it's a problem for the sports teams. And we've all heard and gotten a number of emails from hockey um, players that say, well, their referees are simply not going to go through that testing and that it's hard for them to get their players to do it. So it creates, um, without really any apparent benefit, it creates a real hurdle to the teams that would play in tournaments, unfortunately, mostly outside of the city now. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Weddleton. So just my follow-up then to the administration is, you know, practically speaking, if we delete this tonight, you were planning on amending it uh, sometime this week, which effectively is reissuing it. So um, I guess for Mr. Schutte or Ms. Johnston, whoever can speak to the, the practical impact of this, will it just be that for a couple of days this won't be in effect and then a revised version will be in effect? Uh, how, how, do you, how do you interpret that? Uh, so through the chair, this is Chris Schutte. I'll start, and uh, Kate Vogel will, will follow, follow with the punchline. Um, but what I will start with is the, what you pointed out, Assemblymember Dunbar, uh, which is exactly uh, we've, we are making the updates to the attachment to reflect the intent, I think the intent of what Mr. Weddleton is expressing, although I haven't been able to keep up with his narrative to write it down and understand it uh, fully. But the short answer is, um, yes, we are, we are already going to make this change. Um, and I will pass the microphone to Kate Vogel to speak to the uh, process question. Thank you. Yeah, through the chair, uh, this is Kate Vogel, municipal attorney. I, I think it would be very helpful to understand what the vote means tonight. So I'm hearing two different nuances from um, uh, Sorry, uh, Ms. Vogel, before you continue, uh, I just want to ask yeah. if you're not speaking to please make sure that you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, please continue, Ms. Sure. Vogel. Yep, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Yeah, so there are two different nuances that I've heard. One is, um, and this was part of what was discussed, a, a plan from the administration to um, change the attachment to make it clear that other participants um, in a game outside the municipality that are playing with, the municipal with a team from the municipality do not need to test. Striking the entire provision, as, been, as has been proposed by Assembly Member Weddleton, obviously would, would also remove the requirement that the Anchorage team tests before competing um, uh, outside the municipality. And so it would, it would be helpful to understand if the Assembly had the desire for that part to also be removed because that would obviously uh, impact what... Uh, changes we made or, or reissued. I, I think having an understanding of the Assembly's intent, intent and a united intent would be very helpful for revisions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Constant on the amendment? Yeah, I think this whole process is just a bit out of order. We're referencing documents we don't have before us in any packets. Attachment E is a subset of documents that are not before us and we're discussing potential amendments without seeing text. This hasn't been briefed in any way and we're up at the dais in the night of a meeting and so it feels like it's out of nowhere. I understand the spirit of it and the intent is, is laudable and worthy of consideration, but it's hard to support in the fact that it comes at this last hour and I can't read it and I can't see it and I can't understand it and it's not before us. And so I don't see how we can vote affirmatively on this. But we could take it up in a work session and pick it up at the next meeting. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I simply pulled up the attachment on my computer that I have in front of me, and uh, I can tell you exactly what it says, if, if, you know, if anybody else hasn't been able to do that. Um, but um, I would agree with this amendment, and uh, I'm glad Mr. Weddleton pulled this because I was planning on doing the same. Uh, I was also told that I didn't really need any kind of formalized amendment on this um, because we would just kind of, you know, go on the fly with this one. Um, but this was kind of this whole conversation and this whole concept was what I was 
trying to get to when I was asking my questions uh, during the um, acting mayor's report, and, and that is my concern for this whole concept of pre-competition COVID testing, particularly when our athletes are traveling out of state and then have to travel back into the state or anywhere really within the state. Um, it just, it, it seems pointless. There's just really no reason to ask our athletes if we're trying to protect what's going on here in our community, which I am assuming that that is still what the emergency order is all about. Um, but it doesn't make sense to think that if somebody is leaving, we're going to make them test before they go. So I would actually not only support this, but I, there is other places within this particular attachment that references requiring pre-competition COVID testing uh, for teams that are located or based uh, within the municipality uh, that are actually participating outside of the municipality. So, um, so anyway, I would like to see us uh, eliminate all of those requirements for teams that are leaving uh, to go compete outside of the municipality of Anchorage. So I will support this, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Zolotel on the amendment. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I oppose the amendment. Um, I think we need to think about the logistics of teams traveling. They travel together. And if someone is COVID positive and they travel together, and then they play and compete, and then they come back, there's just opportunity for unknown spread of COVID-19. Um, so I am, uh, I, I would like to give the administration the time that they've asked for um, and respect their request to um, finesse this. Um, similarly, I um, think it's important to remember that if students are traveling in particular to compete and then they come back to school, I actually think post-competition COVID testing is probably part of the key here so that the, someone didn't pick up COVID-19, you know, or contract it during competition in some manner or in the transit and then go back to school or, or back in the community. So. I want to share my thought on that, um, particularly with the administration through this comment, um, as they take the time to finesse this attachment. Um, and let's give them that opportunity. They've been deep into this. And I think, you know, as Mr. Constant said, this feels a little bit rushed um, to be so super specific um, without kind of taking it up um, more deeply um, amongst the members of the body. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Ms. LaFrance? Uh, no. Just confirming, was that no, Ms. LaFrance? Correct, it was no. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presbridia? No. That amendment fails six to four. Uh, next, we have a amendment number one by uh, Assemblywoman Allard. Uh, is there a motion? Chair, I would like to move it. Okay, I have a, a motion to approve from Ms. Allard. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Kennedy. second by Ms. Kennedy. Um, Ms. Allard, would you like to speak to it? Uh, yeah, second. Yes, Chair, thank you. I also um, enclosed an, an AM along with this. It's. I say it every single time I ask to be to be terminated, the emergency declaration. There's um, things we could have put in place that the mayor and the assembly could agree on, and I'm just repeating myself over and over. So I, I believe my assembly members, the community knows where I stand, and 
we'll see what happens. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Ms. Zalatil on the amendment. Yes, um, I strongly oppose this amendment um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, um, we agreed to extend the emergency declaration to mid-April to work through a period of transition. We're working through it. Um, to simply cut that opportunity short uh, makes very little sense. We need an opportunity to hear from the administration, and I've made this request about what pieces we're working to demobilize, what pieces remain um, firmly under the current emergency declaration that we can't see a way forward without, um, so we can discuss what those options may be, and what pieces we've been able to operationalize that are still just important but may not require an emergency declaration. In the testimony earlier tonight, you know, there was some, it sounded like someone was suggesting that we weren't winning COVID-19. There's no winning COVID-19. There's only losing. And we need to mitigate those losses in every way we can. I think the AM in particular is a little misleading. It describes deaths per 100,000. But if we talk about deaths in Anchorage, there were 161. Those 161 individuals, their family, their friends, their contacts, they all lost so much in this pandemic. And we, why should we risk more loss when we have things dialed in, we're working on the transition? It, it just doesn't make sense. It's short-sighted and it, it's a knee-jerk reaction. Um, I think as government and as a legislative body, we move deliberately, we move with information, and we keep the predictability that we have set forward with the mid-April date. So I urge you to vote no on this, and I hope we can continue to evaluate the situation, but not create the turmoil of raising the issue of the emergency declaration every meeting. We need to be taking this time and effort and engaging in ways that we are going to complete this transitionary phase. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to hear from Dr. Johnson, the health department's epidemiologist, about her feeling on this uh, amendment and if she feels it is advisable at this time. So this is Dr. Johnston. Go ahead. Um, so I would say it's not advisable at this time. Um, the current situation is that we're greatly expanding access to vaccines, and that is going to move us hopefully quickly to the point where we won't need an emergency, the emergency declaration. But at this moment, we still have case counts that are actually starting to increase again. Um, they had been coming down for a long time, but we've now hit a relative minimum and are starting to go up slowly. Um, there's concern about um, the COVID variants that have been um, becoming more prevalent in other parts of the country. We have four more cases in Alaska of the P1, which is the um, variant that was um, found in Brazil. And there's certainly concern that even while we have you know, one of the highest vaccination rates in the country, our cases are starting to go up. So either we're seeing changes in behavior as people um, see us getting to the, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, or we're seeing variants that um, aren't being detected yet because we have such limited sequencing capability. Um, but we're still at the point with community transmission where we're in the high community transition, the red zone, according to the CDC for their school reopening guidelines. Um, and so I, I just think this is the wrong time to end the emergency declaration. Um, as I said, I'm very excited that we're opening up vaccine eligibility. That's where I think we need to be putting all of our focus at this point to get as many people um, vaccinated as are willing and able so that we can really squash, you know, get the cases to, to go down again. Um, not that we're going to reach zero, we all understand that, but we want to bring them down to where we're in the lower transmission levels so that we're not worried about having, um, you know, variants taking off and spiking cases and more people ending up 
um, sick and hospitalized. So I strongly feel that it's not the time yet to terminate the emergency declaration. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton? Well, thank you. Uh, I will not um, support ending the emergency proclamation. You know, it, it seems very clear that the emergency orders that um, are allowed under the emergency proclamation are clearly, by all evidence, no longer needed. Um, but the emergency proclamation is not the same as emergency orders. And there are advantages that we've discussed many times on, emergen on the emergency proclamation that we still need to keep it in place as we do the transition that um, Assemblymember Zolotel has mentioned. Um, I, I do want to address one thing that Ms. Zolotel said, and that is, um, you know, it is important to have this resolution at every single meeting in front of us. There is really no single issue more important to us and to this city um, than this, uh, the emergency proclamation, the emergency orders that are um, put forth underneath that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am going to oppose this resolution or the amendment to the resolution based on um, what others have already said, and that is, you know, we're on track for continuing to ease up on the health restrictions and working towards ending the emergency declaration. Um, the administration is working closely with members of the public on specific issues, such as the one that we just discussed concerning team sports. And um, we are moving forward in a way where we can safely keep those, um, where we can keep those, you know, mandates in place, especially with being on the cusp of in-person school, which so many of us have been waiting for it to fully resume. And eliminating all the health protections before that happens creates unnecessary risk. We need to make sure that teachers, police officers, elders, vulnerable persons have been offered the vaccine, which you know is going to continue to roll out this month. And then um, I just also want to note that we've seen, and as Dr. Johnson said, the cases have started to go up. But we've especially seen that in areas like Matsu, where um, they have not just higher numbers of cases, but lower vaccination rates. And while I think a lot of Anchorage residents would continue to observe precautions and wear masks, I don't think people who come um, to Anchorage from the Valley would. And so that um, puts our community at risk, and it jeopardizes the progress we've made and the sacrifices we've made. And then finally, you know, there is is still more work to be done before we roll back or end the emergency proclamation. And Ms. Ellison and Mr. Weddleton and I are, are still um, taking a look at the EOs to AOs to make sure that you know we are have everything in place for that transition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Allard, on the amendment. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate everybody's opinions and thoughts, but I'd like to address uh, my fellow Assembly member, Ms. Zolotel, in saying that my AM was misleading. I would like to point out, just because a dashboard and facts you don't agree with the science doesn't mean it's misleading. The other thing I would like, just one last question to ask uh, Dr. Johnston is, the Muni, are you getting any advice from Dr. Zink, the Department of Health and Social Services for the state of Alaska? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I was switching to mute to my phone. I'm sorry, what about Dr. Zink? Dr. Johnston, are you getting any advice from Dr. Zink or the Department of Health and Social Services from the state of Alaska? So I participate in, in frequent calls that Dr. Zink is on, particularly on Friday afternoons. We have an epidemiologist call, um, and I often ask her questions at that point. Um, so I'd say, yes, I, I do get advice from her. Can I do a follow-up, please? Has she been assisting in writing the mandates? No, she has not. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy on the amendment. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll support this, and for a couple of reasons that, interestingly enough, people have already stated for opposing it. Um, one is this idea that um, we're working toward this uh, goal of figuring out how to wean ourselves off of these emergency declarations and emergency orders. And I'll just remind the the body that we attempted to do that back in November. We had a prelim. Well, at that point, we we had a date set for the end of November to basically get the municipality out of this um, emergency situation uh, and basically have us operating in a way that allowed the municipality to, to function in the way that it did, but to not have to be under an emergency proclamation. And obviously, it's you know months later, and we still haven't made any progress in that in that for that particular um, proclamation. And um, so I tend to think that maybe if we just go ahead and end it abruptly, that everything will begin to um, uh, fall into place as it needs to, and it will just be done very quickly. It seems like uh, we keep pushing out the date, which we have many times, and have yet to see uh, any kind of plan for when it ends, plan for when we're actually not considered in an emergency anymore. And I think everybody agrees that it's really not an emergency. We're, we're obviously existing uh, and uh, things are going about uh, in such a way that we're dealing with, um, with the situation, but it certainly isn't uh, an emergency similar to what we experienced just moments after our 2018 earthquake. Um, so I would like to see this ended, and um, I, I think that, again, this might be one way to do it as quickly as possible, and certainly there will be uh, some momentary pain involved, but at the same time, we've had that for a year now, and I think um, we probably ought to really be, be done with it. Um, the other thing, um, there are so many uh, people that we know have already surpassed any kind of threat or risk of COVID infection. When we have as many people as we do that are vaccinated, when we have as many people as we do uh, that have had COVID and recovered, when we have as many people as we do that are, have never actually been in a, a risk category, um, we pretty much believe that that's over half of our population at this point, which means that half of the population is not even at risk anymore. And, and, and that tells me that that may, means it's not an emergency anymore either. And so even though, as we all know, there will still be COVID around for a while, I mean, even if you look at the results of Spanish flu 100 years ago, it, it lingered for several years. And um, some people did come down with it. It was never uh, one where uh, hospitals were being overwhelmed. And we have, we have accomplished that as well. We've gotten to the point now where our hospitals are not overwhelmed. So even that is not an emergency anymore. Even if we see a rise in cases, that does not equate to the fact that we would need uh, more hospitalization capacity. It just means that people are still passing around COVID. And we also know that so many people um, will never have symptoms uh, even worth having any kind of treatment. So again, it's just time to end this. And if we can't make traction on doing that like we thought we could, then if we actually end it, then believe me, things will get um, back to some kind of semblance of, of normal uh, and in dealing with things that the way we really are now. So I would hope that people would change their minds and actually say, okay, it's time, and let's, uh, let's vote to approve this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant, on the amendment, then yes. I'd like us to vote. Thank you. A number of things I've heard tonight are a bit baffling to me. Um, first, it was stated in one of our peers' testimony that everybody agrees it's not an emergency. I can assure you, everybody does not agree. There was some kind of credence given to a conversation about ending the emergency orders back in October, November. And then the suggestion was we just never did it, but the, ignored the fact that we had the biggest spike in cases that we've seen statewide and nationwide in that exact time frame, which just pushed this conversation to now. And so it's not that we 
didn't or couldn't, it's that the circumstances changed at the exact same time that that process was underway. And so that process became moot by virtue of reality. So here we are, the emergency orders have changed to such a way that we are literally opening everything back up, which is actually the process that was described back in October. We've started moving items off of any kind of restricted list of activities and, and we're working hard to achieve that goal. And so um, while the member from Eagle River has definitely lived up to her commitment to introduce this every time, pretty soon she's actually gonna be right. Today is not that day. So there were some testifiers earlier who listed out numbers of deaths that occurred and in, in comparison to deaths by COVID. In 2017, Alaska had 79 deaths in traffic. We have entire volumes of code, state law, some of the most firm moves against individual liberties are basically for the privilege of driving. But 79 people in Alaska died. 291 have died from COVID in one year. And that's 291 who died when the government took the most assertive action ever seen in American history across the country from the tip of Florida out to Guam, up to Alaska. We stopped the wheels of commerce collectively and in Alaska, only 291 people died. 291 lives, so not only. Those are 291 lives. But the reason we didn't have thousands of lives like other places have is because we responded. And so, when somebody gives you a list of all the other ways you could die and says, but only this many died from COVID, you have to add in there the fact that we took assertive response across the entire United States of America. So while we are not quite there, we are almost there. Today I'll vote no on this. Thank you. With that, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Ms. LaFrance? No. Mr. Weddleton? No. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Presverdia? No. That amendment fails eight to two. We're now on the main motion. Mr. Dunbar? Moved to postpone indefinitely. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Uh, do you want to speak to the motion, Mr. Dunbar? No, this is traditionally how we've disposed of this motion after we have tried amendments, um, because if we pass it or we vote it down, it sort of is confusing in either instance. So we postpone indefinitely, and then it's brought again next 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 meeting typically thank you seeing no further discussion on the motion to postpone indefinitely members and may proceed to vote miss lafrance yes mr weddleton yes miss kennedy no. Mr. Presbridia? Yes. That motion is approved eight to two, so that item is postponed indefinitely. Next, we have item 10D10, Assembly Memorandum Number AM 144-2021, Request for Change Order Number 3 for Contract C-2020. 03297 from Pacific Pile and Rim LP for the Modernization Program Petroleum and Cement Terminal Phase 2 2021 Elements Project for the Municipality of Anchorage. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Second. Uh, Ms. Kennedy, you pulled this item? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually uh, had a question in regard to the additional funds that were requested in this change order. Uh, they were pretty straightforward about the initial 5.6 million, but there's an additional request of 4 million for change order authority to allow for efficient management of any additional unanticipated changes that may arise during the course of construction. So my question is, um, is that an amount being Request, being requested, is that totally separate from the funds for the dredging? 
Um, and could we maybe have some more specifics as to what that could be? Thank you. Who from the administration can respond? Um, through the chair, I'm going to ask Steve Rebuffo, the port director, to start the conversation. Um, he should be online, and we have some other folks from the port that can assist. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, this is uh, Steve Rebuffo, port director. I, I think I understand the question. Uh, there was, in the, well, in the original contract, there was an activity that had to take place as part of the... Uh, as part of the construction before the in-water construction of the PCT began called transitional dredging. And that was, you know, that was accounted for in, in the original contract, and uh, that was performed before the in-water construction could begin. Uh, this particular uh, request is to, is to draw from the contingency of 5.6 million to handle an unforeseen infill activity that happened during the course of the construction this year because the construction barges pretty much stayed in place the entire summer. And as a consequence of that, it slows the water down and silt falls out of suspension and begins to do infill uh, in the project area. Uh, we're at a point now where the construction barges won't have enough water uh, when they come back next year to finish the construction in, in, um, in, the, uh, in the water. So we need to remove the excess infill material. The Corps of Engineers is responsible for taking care of that which is at the dock face uh, and water side of the, uh, of the construction site. And, and they're going to do that when they begin their, uh, their annual dredging operations starting in uh, early to mid-April. What we need to take care of is what would normally be behind the dock and not have to be dredged at all. But because next year's in-water construction is the installation of the monopiles for the mooring dolphins and the catwalks, uh, and a lot of that infrastructure is behind the face of the dock, we have to get in there and do that now so that the construction barges can get back there and safely float uh, to be able to do that construction. So, you know, this is part of the contingency that's already been, uh, you know, set aside. And, uh, and I, I, it's, a, it's a valid requirement. And God, I hope that answers your question. Can I follow up, Mr. Chair, please? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I fully understand the need for the dredging funding, which apparently has a range of anywhere between 3.2 million to 5.6 million. And it just is going to depend uh, once they get the dredgers in there and find out really how much uh, work they're going to have to do. I understand that there's a range there, so you're asking for the 5.6 million. But further down in, uh, in, in the uh, memorandum, it says that this action also adds a total of four million of change order authority to be utilized for unanticipated changes during the life of the project. And it goes further and says this four million change order amount is not included in the $72,909,736.20 listed above. So I'm just trying to get a handle on why in this language here we're, we're talking about where the 56 or the $5.6 million is going to go, and that's going to be toward dredging. But then again, there's this additional $4 million change order authority uh, for um, additional unanticipated changes that may arise during the course of construction. So to me, that's a, a totally separate amount from the dredging, and I don't know if that's true or not. But if it is part of the dredging, why wasn't the dredging cost then $9,600,000? Um, so I'm sorry, you know, if I'm not asking the question right, I'm just reading what is on here, and I'm just trying to figure out where that, why the request for an additional $4 million for unanticipated changes that may, may or may not arise. I, I think I'm going to phone a friend for, uh, for a little help with that. Because uh, I did, I did not write the AM, but uh, I, I think Sharon had a hand in it. Hello, this is Sharon. Can you hear me? Yes, Sharon we Walsh. can. 
Thank you. Uh, through the chair, the, the uh, situation that uh, we're in now because of the dredging is that our change order authority is, you know, uh, original is being um, exceeded and we have a very complex project ahead of us. Uh, things have been going on all winter long in procurement and we have, you know, we have 12 or six 12 inch pipelines to be installed. We have a hose tire to be installed. We have um, uh, all the mooring and breasting dolphins to be installed. And with any construction project, especially one with all the bells and whistles that this one has, there are uh, other things that come up during construction that you need to do a change. Sometimes they're a deductive change. Sometimes, uh, but you find you need um, you need to reroute a pipeline or something like that that we won't know until we actually start doing the work. So we are um, actually have a um, change order weekly change order meeting established to watch every every penny, and uh, the, this is simply uh, to have because we have exhausted the usual change order authority because of this unexpected dredging. This is to um, allow us to continue to administer the project efficiently. Uh, and um, to get it done. Now, we may not use any more of that $4 million, or we, you know, may use half of it. Um, you know, that'll happen as the um, work progresses. I hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you, Ms. Walsh. And if I could, Mr. Chair, I'd like to kind of follow up on that again. Sure. One mm -hmm. final follow-up. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, yes, okay. So it's interesting, though, that we have before us right now um, this change order authority for the $5.6 million, and we're just kind of adding in there a potential, well, maybe we'll need $4 million more. So because you actually brought this forward, it details to us exactly why we're going to do a change order for the five point six or up to uh, $5.6 million. Why would we not, why would the assembly not have the same opportunity to do that with something else that comes up uh, that, you know, an, unforese an unforeseen or unanticipated uh, problem during the course of construction? Why would we not have the opportunity to also see that? Or are you saying that we actually would? And so again, it's kind of the question of why are we authorizing a new $4 million change order with this document and at this time. So, thank hey, you. Sure. Through, through the chair, and I believe Mr. Haddon may also be on uh, the line and may want to chime in here, but in, in advance of that, uh, you know, the uh, all, I mean, all construction contracts in this municipality let have a certain percentage of change order authority that's authorized at the time of award of the contract, simply for efficiency, because um, you, it would be, uh, because change is a part of every contract, uh, I would say very few of them are accomplished with zero changes, that it would be really bogged the assembly down if we came to the assembly with each change order that we need. Um, however, you know, there's a limit, and that's why there's a limit on change order authority, and that's why uh, when we have exceeded that limit, we come to you and explain why, and our goal is to efficiently manage the rest of the project and to not have to come back to you. Uh, so it, it's um, a matter of uh, following the way the purchasing requirements are and making sure we keep the assembly informed when things, something uh, big gets, uh, you know, pops up, and that's why we're here, um, and we very much understand in no way, shape, or form are we to exceed our change order authority without the assembly's approval, but we do need the latitude to be able to efficiently manage day-to-day -day, um, situations that come up on the job that we have to negotiate with the contractor. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chair, this is uh, Ron Hadnett. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Haddon. Uh, yes, uh, through the chair uh, to Ms. Kennedy to amplify a little bit on what Sharon said. If you did not approve the $4 million change order tonight or some other amount, then if we had a $1 change order uh, after this action is approved, then we would have to come back to you for that approval. So what we're asking you for is a $4 million uh, change order authority 
that that amount could have been six million, could have been ten million. We debated back and forth within the uh, within the team on what dollar amount do we think it will realistically take us to finish the project. And that four million dollar change order authority is the amount that we are uh, estimating that it will take us to finish the project. It's entirely possible we may not use it. It's entirely possible we could come back uh, at a later time and say we found some other changes. Uh, and incidentally, this change order authority is within the approved and authorized budget of the project. Don't know if that helps or uh, clarify things. Yes, thank you, Mr. Haddon. That does. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? A hesitant yes. Thank you. Mr. Presverdia? Mr. Presverdia? That item is approved nine to zero. Next, we have item 10E4, resolution number AR 2021-69, resolution of the municipality of Anchorage appropriating 403,206 as a grant from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant and appropriating 8,867 as a contribution from the 2021 Anchorage Police Department operating budget, Anchorage Metropolitan Police Service Area Fund, all to the Federal Grants Fund, Anchorage Police Department for the mobile data computer laptop refresh and headquarters security upgrade project. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy, you pulled this item? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I pulled this one because I had an interesting uh, piece to the bottom that I, uh, that I thought was very interesting and would be interesting to the public. And, you know, maybe I have missed it in the past, but I haven't seen where a public meeting would be required for the issuance of a grant. So I don't know if that's typical or not, but it says that um, there was the requirement uh, to hold a public hearing, and there was one held on July 28th uh, at the police department headquarters to provide the opportunity for comment by local citizens and community organizations, but no public comments were expressed at the meeting. So, um, so one of my questions was, um, uh, you know, how was the meeting advertised? Uh, were the, was it advertised to any group specifically? Um, and, you know, and somebody can certainly answer those questions for me if, if somebody is there and available to do that. But again, I just thought this was a kind of an interesting concept where the public comments were invited, uh, yet there were no comments, so I don't know if that meant people showed up or not. But I kind of bring this up because um, it seems to me that there are multiple opportunities for the public to participate in beauty issues, and um, APD seems to have also had those opportunities specifically, and I want to make sure the public's aware of that. Um, and I think it also might be something that we need to make sure we're actually getting on the calendar in the upcoming events on the Muni website. Um, so, you know, I really want people to understand that there's a lot going on out there that people can participate in, and this apparently was one of them. So um, if there's any feedback from APD about this particular uh, public comment period uh, and how they went about um, trying to advertise it, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing that. Thank you. Before someone from the administration responds, uh, just a reminder for folks on the phone, if you are not recognized to speak, to please make sure that you are on mute. Um, who from the administration can respond? Through the chair, I'm gonna ask Chief Dahl to jump in and while he's uh, getting uh, online here, um, I think Assembly Member Kennedy brings up another good point is that many grant tours um, whether it's the Department of Justice, uh, the Department of Highways, they typically require a separate public hearing process as a granting agency, and they have to do it in that manner, uh, in addition to the process that comes through here. But I think uh, Ms. Kennedy's point about there is a lot of opportunity for folks to comment oh on my God. opportunities. Um, Ringo is like 
like sitting as Whoops. close to that? Um, so again, if you are not uh, recognized to speak, which that individual was not, uh, please make sure that you are on mute. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Wilbur. Uh, that's all I had. I'm going to see if Chief Dahl's on the line. Chief Dong? Mr. Chairman, we can either come back to the item or um, we'll get the answer to Mr. Ms. Kennedy's question about the process they went to to advertise for this public hearing at the APD building. And that's fine with me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, again, I wanted to make sure that the public actually had some information in regard to this too, so I'm happy to wait for the answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so with that, uh, members can proceed to vote. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presbridia? That item is approved nine to zero. Next, we have item 10F3, information memorandum number AIM 38-2021, emergency procurements awarded under AMC 7.20.090. As a reminder, the motion here is a motion to accept. What is the will of the body? Move to accept. Second. Moved Second. and seconded. Uh, Ms. Kennedy, you pulled the item? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on this one, there is an entry um, for a vaccine hesitance survey for $10,000. And again, I felt like this was a good one to bring up just for public awareness. Uh, I have not heard about this um, vaccine hesitancy survey yet. It's something that we've been apparently um, spending some money on uh, or will be spending some money on for the next several months. So I just wondered if I could, if we could get an update about where this survey is available, how do people access it? And at some point, I'm assuming we'll see the results. And um, so just wondering when that might be. And then what does the municipality intend to do with the information? Thanks. Uh, through the chair, Ms. Kennedy, I'm going to start with uh, Ron Haddon, and then Bob Dole should be on the phone. So whichever of you gentlemen wants to start the conversation to address Ms. Kennedy's question, please. Through the chair, this is MOA COVID Response Incident Commander Bob Dole. And the vaccine hesitancy survey, uh, we partnered uh, with Conquer COVID uh, to get a survey that what they were already sending out and enhanced the number of uh, questions or respondents they would get out of Anchorage. Uh, and we, are, we have a draft copy this week, and we're going over it with uh, the pollster to understand additional data from it later this week. The reason we requested this survey is to understand what that level is of individuals who uh, are unwilling to get the survey and why. That does two things for us. Uh, when we had tiers up until tonight, it gave us an idea of when we were approaching a saturation point. More importantly, towards moving forward, it tells us what the attitudes we are, are out there in different demographic groups that are uh, leading people to be resistant to taking the survey. With that information, we're able to figure out where we need to provide information that may overcome that hesitance or what the challenges are in doing it. So we see it as a tool to increase um, vaccination rates within the municipality. Um, this this um, was a one-time survey. Uh, the initial results show about 30% of our population uh, is, hes is uh, hesitant or un unwilling to get the vaccination. That's a substantial number when Dr. Johnston is talking about uh, those ideal numbers we should have uh, for building up that herd immunity. Thank you, Mr. Dole. And so if we're, if we're not putting anything out till at least next week, like you said, there would be a draft maybe available next week. But um, how are we going to advertise this to the public and make them aware that this is available for them to take this survey? 
Thanks. Uh, the survey was already conducted. We paid for the pollster to the pollsters to go out and contact folks. The survey has been done. This isn't one for the public to participate in, but rather a random sampling across different demographic groups to try to capture the existing attitudes out there. So the survey has been done already. Uh, there, uh, we can create uh, far easier means for uh, folks to continue offering their thoughts on it. This one was deliberately designed to kind of create a balance of um, representative of Anchorage society. Okay, well, thank you. I misunderstood then. Um, and then what was your reference then to having a draft next week? Is that just a draft report? Uh, we have a draft report now that uh, we need to go over the, uh, with the surveyors to make sure we, uh, the results are put in context and address any um, ambiguities in it. And from there, uh, we should be getting a final report. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Thank you. Uh, since we're on this topic, uh, today I sat in on a session with the National League of Cities Congressional Conference with the CDC. And uh, it was a very interesting conversation. I will be sharing the files with the members uh, tomorrow. And uh, they talked about a number of things like uh, don't spend a lot of time focusing on people who are hesitant to take the vaccine, but instead celebrate the people who are, push out the opportunity, build the excitement, and do a lot of positive things. While we need to know, and I think the study, the purpose is to understand why people are hesitant, that was their recommendation. And interestingly, a friend of mine, Nick Kenshilo, who owns Anchorage Remote Auto Start, and I were talking yesterday about what community leaders in the various communities of color uh, could we reach out to and, and enlist in a campaign because we know that the COVID uh, virus has impacted the, the Asian and Pacific Islander community and the Hispanic community, the, the, the black community, in ways much more dramatic than it has to us. And I'm hopeful and excited that the municipality is going to begin the work of positively motivating people to take the next step, be a superhero, and get that vaccine. And now that the governor has moved to open season, that anyone can get one that asks one, I think the time is now for a campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to accept. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presvardia? Yes. That item has been accepted 10 to 0. Next, we have item 10G3, uh, AM 156-2021, Anchorage Community Development Authority Board of Directors Appointments. Um, before we introduce this item, Ms. Alatol, you pulled it? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, at the request of the administration, um, the request is to introduce, to amend, to correct some typos as to the dates, and then to have it proceed to public hearing. Okay, sure. So um, we're going to take a, a quick break so I can confer with the clerk.
clarification from the clerk uh, regarding this item. And it looks like what we will do is just introduce this item tonight. And then we will have amendments to the item, which will be before the body when this is back to us on the March 23rd meeting. So um, with that, can I get a motion to introduce? So move. Second. And can I get a third? Third. OK. Third. All right, so that item has been introduced. And from what I understand, there will be amendments to clarify um, some of the terms uh, as outlined in the AM. OK, so next we have um, item 10G6, which is the unnumbered AO uh, 2021, an ordinance approving an amount to be made available from local sources for school bond debt reimbursement for bonds passed prior to 2015. Um, Ms. Zalatel, you pulled this item? Yes, I'd like to change the order today to take this up after item 14A. Second. Moved and seconded. Do you want to speak to that, Ms. Zalatel? Um, yes, thank you. Um, this um, item would uh, only be necessary if there is a decision to uh, proceed with the S version of the 14A item. If not, um, then it will not need to be introduced. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Is there any opposition to the motion? Okay, seeing none, then we will take this up after item 14A. All right, so with that, um, we, before we take our regular break, we're actually gonna go ahead and uh, complete item 13A and then after 13A, we will take our regular break. So, for testimony on public hearing items, please direct your comments to the assembly or the chair. Please give your name at the start of your testimony. You will have three minutes to testify. Your comments must remain on the topic of the matter before us and personal attacks are not appropriate. I may interrupt you if you do not follow these rules for testimony. In addition, audience members are asked to avoid clapping or other disruptions during public testimony. Last, questions asked in your testimony, which are allowed, may be addressed during deliberation. I will, as chair, work to maintain decorum at this meeting and ask for your assistance. All right, so next we have before us item 13A, resolution number AR 2021-3, resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly to name the Girdwood Baseball Field as the Sladen J. Mole Memorial Field. Um, we're going to go ahead, as usual, start with um, public testimony on the phone and then go back and forth. So let's go ahead and start with uh, Ms. Betsy Connell. Hello, this is Betsy. Hi, Ms. Connell. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 13A, AR 2021-3. Uh, you have three minutes. Welcome. Hi, my name is Betsy Connell, um, and I'm speaking uh, regarding resolution AR 2021-3, a resolution to name the Ger Girdwood baseball field as the Slade J. Bowl Memorial Field. Slayton was a student of mine for several years at Girdwood School, where he attended from kindergarten to eighth grade. Early on, reading and writing were challenging for Slayton, but he was persistent and worked hard to improve his skills. I'd like to think that he brought these same habits and energy to baseball. I was paging through Girdwood School yearbooks this afternoon to spark some memories of Slayton. He'd already been bitten by the baseball glove by fourth grade. He was already posing in a class photo with his baseball hat and gloves. He was the cool dude in sunglasses, the skateboarder, the Boy Scout, the fisherman, the skier, the snowboarder. In eighth grade, he was voted as having the best hair. But by eighth grade, his likes were baseball, the Atlanta Braves, and all things related to baseball. His entire personal page in the eighth grade yearbook, his eighth grade yearbook was, pertained, was pertaining to baseball. It was already his world. Slayton often had a great smile on his face, sometimes mischievous, always with a sense of humor and fun. These were the times I knew Slayton best. 
I know that he went on to play ball for South and, and also in college. I've learned that he enjoyed coaching younger kids in baseball as well as playing the game. I also learned that he was there for his teammates, supporting them both on and off the field. His life was stuffed out way too early. It would be a fitting tribute to name the Girdwood baseball field after Sl Sladen J. Moore. His legacy is certainly baseball, and I think Sladen would like his story told to generations of children at Girdwood that impaired driving is never a good idea. Sladen Strong, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Ms. Sarah Sarlus. Next, we have Miss Ashley Wade. Hi, Ms. Wade. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 13A, AR 2021-3. We have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm speaking on behalf of Four Valleys Community School in Girdwood. Um, <clears throat> Four Valleys Community School strongly supports naming the ball fields in Girdwood after former resident Sladen Mall. The ball field is a well-used facility that brings our community together recreationally and functions as a key community asset. Four Valleys Community School uses the ball fields to run summer programs for local youth. Having Slayton's name attached to the ball field would give the location meaning and significance, and is especially appropriate because Slayton was an individual who contributed to the field itself with many hours of volunteer maintenance work beginning from a young age, in addition to the years spent playing ball on the field. We believe that naming the ball field after Slayton is a meaningful way of recognizing a wonderful young man who has deep connections to both our community and the ball field. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, We're gonna go ahead and switch to in person. Uh, would anyone like to testify? Welcome. My name is Kelly. I'm Slayton's mom. I'm going to be okay. One second here. Um, I really want to start by thanking the Girdwood community for all the work that they have done in getting this resolution pushed so far. It means so much to see all the love and support for Slayton and our family. Girdwood is an incredible place, and I feel blessed to have raised my children there. Girdwood holds so many special memories of watching Slayton and his siblings grow up. When people asked Slayton where he was from, he always said Girdwood, Alaska. It's where Slayton learned to ski and snowboard. It's where he learned to ride a bike, where he caught his first silver salmon, and where his love for baseball began. <coughs> Growing up in Girdwood helped mold him into the wonderful young man he had become. He loved life, and it showed in everything that he did. <laughs> Slayton loved sports, and baseball became his favorite but he was a lot more than just an athlete. He was kind, he was funny, he was loyal to his family and friends. He had a huge heart and infectious smile that I miss so much. He was motivated to be the best and it showed not just physically, but mentally as well. He was making all the right choices. So Slade not only loved playing baseball, but he loved coaching little kids as well. And they loved him. After Bucks games, I would watch little kids run up for an autograph, and you could hear them yelling, Slayden, Slayden, will you play pickle with us? 
And of course, a little while later, you would see him running up and down the third baseline with a herd of kids and a huge smile on his face. And he was no doubt having just as much fun as then. So I think naming the field after him is an honor and one that he would be proud of. His values and character are shown in everything that he did. He was a role model for not only the youth, but for all of us. So please help us to not only remember Slayton for the positive influence he had on all that met him, but also to bring awareness to such a senseless tragedy. So thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions for you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Allard. Hi, Kelly. I, I know the extended family out in Eagle River, and thank you for... Uh, Thanks for lending him to us for 19 years. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to testify in person before we go back to the phones? Yeah. Welcome. You can take it off if, if you would like, but if you could pull that down, that'd be helpful too. Could we get the video up? Sorry, so um, I, I don't, I'm not, sounds like no one knows about a video. So if you can come back when we get to deliberation after public testimony, uh, then we can go ahead and, and do that video. Okay. Yeah, so if you could just make sure that the video gets sent to someone in the clerk's office. That'd be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, would anyone else uh, in person like to testify? Okay, uh, then we'll go ahead and go back to the phones. Okay, so uh, next we have uh, Mr. Dennis Young. Hi, Mr. Young, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 13A, ER number 2021-3. You have three minutes. Welcome. Hello, my name is Dennis Young. I'm president of uh, the Taylor Young Memorial Foundation. I am calling in support of naming the Little League ball field after Slade Mall. Um, I think it'd be a duly good honor uh, to be placed upon him that uh, he's given so much to the baseball community in, in Anchorage and in the Girdwood area. Um, that's basically it. Thank you for your testimony. All right, thank you. Uh, next, we're gonna go to uh, Mr. Mole. I'm here. Great. Uh, thanks for still being with us, Mr. Mole. Um, I'm told that you wanted to speak, so uh, go ahead, Mr. Mole. So it is so bittersweet that honoring Sladen in this way is on the agenda for this assembly meeting. I never would have imagined that I would be in a position to write a testimony like this. I am so grateful to the Anchorage Assembly for taking this matter into consideration. Thank you so much. When I think about all the memories I shared with Slayton, especially the memories that involve Girdwood, it brings me to a place of profound emotion. Girdwood holds a, such a special place in my heart. I am so grateful for having had the opportunity to raise my children there as the experiences were that were shared brought us so much joy. 
Countless hours were spent by Sladen playing at the Girdwood Park. Within that park that he loves so much is the baseball field where Girdwood kids that want to learn how to play baseball learn how to play baseball. The convenience of having that baseball park so close to our home was such a blessing. Sladen started playing baseball for the Girdwood Grizzlies at the age of T-ball and continued to play with that team until he aged out of Little League. Baseball became Sladen's passion at a very young age, and the Girdwood Grizzlies played an integral role as to why Sladen fell in love with baseball. Girdwood is such a tight-knit community, and that community played an integral part in molding Sladen into the man he became. As a result, Sladen's character became one of admiration amongst his loved ones and his peers. He was such a kind, compassionate, loving young man. He was beyond driven from a young age to become not only the best baseball player he could become, but also the best man that he could become. His life goal was to get his education while playing baseball for that co- the college that he attended. His sheer will, will, hard work, perseverance, and his unwavering unwa- faith in God are just a few of his character assets that enabled him to achieve that goal. This is quite an accomplishment for any young man, much less for a young man coming out of Girdwood, Alaska. Most Girdwood kids are known for snow sport. Sladen is known for baseball. His baseball skills, skills that he started to develop while playing baseball at the Girdwood Field, earned him the respect of his coaches and the Anchorage baseball community. Those skills that he started to develop while playing baseball for the Girdwood Grizzlies and honed in while playing baseball for the South Anchorage High School Wolverines caught the eye of the Anchorage Bucks team managers. In fact, the Anchorage Bucks asked Sladen to start practicing with them when Sladen was a senior at South Anchorage High School, and he was added to their roster following that season. Sladen was not only a good athlete, he was an outstanding student. He graduated cum laude from South Anchorage High School, and his ability to manage a GPA of 3.85 while maintaining a rigorous baseball program is what set him apart from simply being a great high school athlete. His determination to achieve that life goal that I mentioned earlier caused him to become a prospect for several college baseball teams. He also became a great role model, especially amongst the baseball community. So many kids look up to Sladen. It is so incredible that, and I am so proud of the positive impact he had on the lives of so many people in the short time he was with us. Sladen's impact was so great that the South Anchorage High School Wolverines, the Anchorage Bucks, and the El Camino uh, College Warriors retired his jersey. A wall mural was hung up in his memory at the college he attended. Plaques were placed on park benches and three different locations to bring awareness to our youth and to our community about impaired driving. There is definitely something to be said about the amount of recognition that came from three different baseball clubs. I am so proud of what Sladen accomplished in his lifetime. What an honor it is to be the father of Sladen Mole. What an honor it would be to have his legacy live on by approving this agenda item and renaming the Girdwood Little League Field in his honor. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go ahead and try uh, Miss Sarah Sarluce one more time. And uh, going back to in person, would anyone else like to testify?
Welcome. Rachel Colvard. I have no connection to the family. Um, I was subbing at South when the news came across to that community and they were absolutely gutted. And I would just like to lend my support that hopefully you'll pass this and it will be unanimous. Um, you always want people from a little town to make it and he was making it and that life was cut short and I think this is a great way to honor him and that smaller satellite community to the Anchorage family. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify? Are, are we ready for the video? Great, it looks like we are ready for the video. So if we can go ahead and pull that up. Mr. And, Chair. Yes, Mr. Constant. Just procedurally, so the public understands, we are still in the public hearing, and normally folks would get three minutes sharing uh, as the staff member for the commission, and so um, normally we wouldn't allow more than three minutes, but in this case, it's okay. But I just wanted to make sure people understand that that's why. Thank you, Mr. Constant, for that clarification. Sladen, uh, excuse me, Sladen was born in June 1st, 1999, and raised in the Girdwood Valley. During his young life and through his preteen years, Sladen attended Girdwood School from kindergarten through eighth. He enjoyed many activities such as Girdwood's Cub Scouts, Girdwood Chapel, fishing, and family. Sladen's love for life showed in his family unity, compassion, and unwavering faith. Sladen, Sladen found his love for baseball, if you, can, if you can turn it to the next one, um, at a young age, playing every year on the Girdwood Little League team. He worked hard to be one of the um, star players. During his high school years, Sladen played on the South Anchorage High School baseball team. Baseball gave him self-assurance to mentor young players at baseball camps. While playing for the Anchorage Bucks, he was recruited by the Lewis and Clark State College his freshman year. He later transferred to El Camino Community College in California and started as their catcher. Sladen's independent life was just beginning and on April 18, 2019, his promising life was taken, hit and killed by a drunk driver at the young age of 19. His surviving family has forever been altered and left to grieve with the fact that he will never be able to pursue a professional baseball or have a family of his own. The community of Girdwood came together to show enormous love and support for his family. Many have said that Sladen was a great role model and friend. Numerous young people wanted to be just like him. He was turning out to be an outstanding man with exceptional character. So to make his life not, so to make sure that his life is not in vain, more robust efforts need to be brought forth in bringing better awareness to young people and adults regarding driving while intoxicated. The naming panel implores the assembly to pass a resolution so that the Anchorage community will remember Slayton. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your work with the naming panel. All right, open it up one last time. Would anyone else like to testify? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, actually, we do have one thing. So um, there is a laid on the table AIM. It's unnumbered by Assemblymember LaFrance. All of the members should have gotten it, and I think there are copies available for the public as well. Um, so in order to properly uh, get this added, uh, I would need a motion to lay this on the table to incorporate to AR 2021-3. So moved. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Ms. LaFrance, could you provide the justification for laying this on the table, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is in regards to the conversation we had at the last assembly meeting concerning the revised code um, from 2017 regarding consideration of indigenous names. And this aim summarizes the findings um, on Girdwood's history and references the inclusion of the president of the Native Village of Eklutna, Aaron Leggett, in this process. And um, it was laid on the table because um, 
I was working with community members and um, the administration to put this together. So I appreciate the body's consideration to accept it laid on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. perez Verdia on the motion to lay this on the table. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to um, take this moment uh, to thank Ms. LaFrance and, and uh, the naming panel and, and all of the, the folks involved in this um, for their work in reaching out to the, the native village of Akutna and for, um, for looking into the history of this place. Uh, I, I had said in a previous meeting that it absolutely, my, my questions were absolutely not about um, whether or not uh, uh, the, the person that's being named here uh, today um, was uh, the right person or it wasn't about the value of that person at all. It was cer certainly just about trying to make sure that we're following the process that we have. And, and I, I just want to just, just say on the record that I uh, appreciate the work to, to re reach out to the tribe and to learn more about the, this area. Um, and, and I certainly support the, the effort to move forward in naming it um, in the way that we have planned for today. So thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to lay this on the table. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presbardia? Yes. Okay, that motion to lay on the table has been approved 10 to 0. We're now back on the main motion. Mr. Weddleton? Oh, thanks. You know, I, um, you know this is, uh, I clearly support this. I think it's a great idea. And it's been a long haul for the people of Girdwood. It's, um, it's discussed a number of times at the Girdwood Board of Supervisors and at their land use committee where they have public hearings. And, uh, you know, I was I just happened to be talking to the, um, Park Superintendent at Abbott or Rabbit Fields on something going on there, and two young men were there who wanted to put up a bench, and it were they were friends of Sladen's, and just talking to them and the way they spoke about him, I thought, holy smokes! I never had friends this passionate about anything in high school, and it really um, showed what this very special young man, and they've installed a number of benches for him. Um, one up at uh, Glen Alps, and then the one over at Abbott or Rabbit, I believe the third one. And, uh, you know, it's just incredible that someone would inspire that in, in his friends. And then seeing the number of email testimony we got in support from teachers and friends and neighbors and parents of friends, and um, it's really impressive. So this, this is clearly a very, very special young man that, um, you know, the community lost. So support this and, and it really... I look forward to the ribbon cutting in Gurdwin. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And my heart goes out to this young man's family and friends. I am so very sorry for your loss of Sladen. And this young man was clearly beloved by his community. And renaming the ball fields in his hometown um, is a fitting tribute and a nice way to remember him. So thank you to all the community members who have worked who have worked to make this renaming happen. And uh, thanks also to Ms. Sharon Lane for her work in coordinating. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to approve. Mr. France? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presvardia? Yes. That motion is approved 10 to 0. All right, so we, we are going to go ahead and uh, take our normal 20-minute break. And when we come back, we will be at item 14A. Thank you.
go ahead and get started. So we have before us item 14A, ordinance number AO 2021-23, an ordinance determining and approving the total amount of the annual operating budget of the Anchorage School District for its fiscal year 2021-2022 and determining and appropriating the portion of the assembly approved budget amount to be made available from local sources. Public testimony is now open on this item. We'll start with phone testimony, uh, starting with uh, Ms. Uh, Cassie Fretwell. The tone. Okay. Please. Uh, then we will go to Mr. Niall Williams. Hi, Mr. Williams. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14A, AO 2021-23. You have three minutes. Welcome. Hi, yes, Niall Williams. I represent 1776 Alaska Freedom and Liberty Worldwide. I'm also represented, well, underrepresented by Cameron perez Verdia, who's absent, and the vacant seat for the acting mayor, Austin Quinn Davidson. In response to 2021-23, we strongly oppose the passing of this budget, which is insanely bloated for the Anchorage School District. 86% of these funds go to teacher salaries for which they are not reporting to school in person. The cost of the health care of the union costs are way too high for this school district for the lackluster results that we achieve. Students are failing at an astronomical rate. The math and science skills are not there. I'm running for school board, school board CE. My name is Niall Sherwood Williams. Vote me in, I'll reopen all schools immediately. I will prevent discrimination against those that choose not to wear a mask uh, and Mr. choose Williams. not to va vaccinate. <laughs> Mr. That's Williams. all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and try uh, Ms. Fretwell one more time. Okay, uh, that completes our phone testimony. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to in-person. Welcome. Good evening. Um, my name is Scott Sikinga. Uh, I, uh, I think that, uh, you know, school's a great thing, um, but uh, my recommendation to everyone in Anchorage that um, is listening is at this point homeschool your children um, every person that does removes the federal funding from this obviously failing school system that we have in Anchorage um, if you have the option and you already have the kids at home sign up for um, homeschooling you know so my wife and I are doing um, we would do it anyway but uh, it's just it's a good way to send a message of um, of, 
not support for the, the failing system that's in place. Um, we need to look at good board members. We need to look at restructuring from the top down. Uh, obviously, we've thrown money at our school. We are, I think, one of the highest cost school, dis uh, school districts in, the, in the, all of US. And uh, throwing money at it with bad leadership is just a black hole that it gets sucked into and doesn't do anything. So my recommendation goes back to get your kids out of the school, homeschool them until we, this gets changed from the top down. Um, I hate to say that, and I didn't really plan on talking about this today, but I saw this, and it, it's, it's one way, it's the one thing that you can do if you're a member of Anchorage. Pull your kid out, it sends a message, they'll not get the funding and hopefully change from the top down. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for allowing me to speak. I very much appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify? That is up to the body, uh, okay. so I, I, don't, I don't know. The reason I ask that, because then I would delay my speaking if you're going no, to do I, that. No, I understand why you're asking the question, but I honestly don't know. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman. Um, I follow the public process. When the public process is done appropriately, decision made by the governing body is more like the public interest. Um, it really concerns me. Look at the number of people. I guess I'm the third one speaking on this, and I don't see anyone in sight that's going to come in. And we're dealing with the school proposed school budget in the midst of COVID. This is alarming. As I said in a previous meeting, that uh, many of those regulars that have been known to address the assembly over the years, they're not on that phone. They're not calling in. They're not in this room. I'm not saying that uh, they don't have an interest. They definitely show they have an interest in what's going on in the community, particularly dealing with the proposed budget. But how can the assembly tonight even consider approving this budget or discussing this budget. And uh, I don't recall any work sessions except for the meeting yesterday, respectfully, that was a joint meeting with the school board and the assembly, where it was difficult for the people to identify how to sign up to call in. But I had, the, because of my knowledge, I went to another agenda, another meeting, and I was able to be the only one that called in was that you called so I can speak. This you can't you can't proceed. But I'd like to close these comments of concern. One is the concern that there may be dispute by many in this room, and I don't mean by most of you there before you, that the the emergency is not over. You don't have a governor that is doing much dealing with it, but it's still an emergency. But as I said to you, dealing with salaries and part of the budget, single part of that budget dealing with the school district is increasing costs, dealing with increasing salaries and benefits. And in this time, this is not the thing to do. It's a not, it should not approve monies to increase salaries and benefits to government employees. That's a message that should not go and be told to people are wondering they're going to be in business tomorrow and people are going to wonder to have a job tomorrow. But you ignored that issue over the time of many of these different contracts and one of the most significant contracts that you got up there is dealing with the school district. And then in closing thing, dealing with COVID and sh short-term monies that um, deal with COVID, how are we successfully going to handle the school district and their budget dealing with COVID in the future and the COVIDs in the future, how are we ready that we didn't have to ha go and have no plan and then we had to work it out over a long period of time? Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. 
Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Presbydia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few items uh, to address. Uh, just a um, uh, response to a few of the comments made in public test to testimony. First of all, I'm not absent. I'm here. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one is um, that I certainly respect those parents that uh, choose to homeschool their ch children, and and I would I would uh, respect those 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 decisions. But the truth is, is that we do not have a failing school system in Anchorage. We have an excellent school system in, in Anchorage, um, and and I'm very proud of it, and I'm proud to put my kids in it. Um, and the, the the last point is around leadership. We have some of the best leadership in our school district that we've had in years. Um, and it's been a very, very difficult last few, few years. Um, but I want to make sure that I put on the record that, that I stand behind the leadership of our school dis district. And I want to really encourage um, parents in our, in our community to, uh, to have faith in our schools and to uh, have faith in the people that lead, lead them. So uh, I encourage us to, uh, to proceed forward and, and approve the budget before us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Zolotel? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was hoping to move the S, um, and it was not moved. Um, can, as a point of clarification, can I go ahead and move the S? Uh, I think what I'll go ahead and do, who are the mover? I can't see who made the motion. So what I'll go ahead and do is I'll just clarify with the mover and secondary, which were Mr. Constant and Ms. Zolotel. Is the S version OK? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. May I please speak? Yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, so the S version um, for the members and the public removes the bond debt reimbursement portion. Um, the purpose of doing this is to separate these issues. Um, while all of it is part of the ASD budget, I think it is very important that we take up the issues around um, the operating budget right now. Um, and, and get this approved, um, but that we spend what I'm hoping is the next two weeks advocating with the legislature to try to get supplemental funding for the FY21 um, bond debt reimbursement for 2015 because we are literally being left holding the bag. We are going to pass this on to taxpayers. Um, so I think two weeks, it's all we've got because we're still in the 30-day window for purposes of this budget. But um, I think we owe it to um, the residents of Anchorage, and um, but that shouldn't hold up passing the operating budget so ASD can move forward with its planning purposes. It would bring the other item um, before us to be introduced and then um, for the meeting of the 23rd. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Uh, thank you. Ms. Kennedy? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, hold on. We're adjusting the volume on our end. Go okay. ahead. Is that, no, wait. Wait, how go. about yeah. that? Is that better? That's better. Okay, got it. Uh, um, thank you. Um, I guess. I have concerns about uh, some of the thoughts that are kind of going on here, too. And uh, uh, timing-wise, uh, I'm hoping that uh, this doesn't uh, really cause any concern. But uh, I would like to move to postpone the entire uh, decision till the next meeting of um, March 23rd. OK, so there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Do you want to speak to that, Ms. Kennedy? Well, yes, I would. Thank you. Uh, you know, a couple of concerns. First of all, I am surprised that there is not more public input. Um, and granted, it could be the idea that people kind of want to stay away. It could be the idea that everybody loves what, you know, the Anchorage School District has done in terms of their budget. But uh, very rarely have we, you know, been at a place where, um, where we just have so little input. So uh, I think having a second week and a second opportunity, uh, I, you know, I would also move not only to postpone but to continue the public hearing. So I might have to 
amend my motion on that to make that clear. But um, if it's not a problem for the Anchorage School District to wait until we decide uh, more about the um, bond debt reimbursement issue, then I think we can uh, also uh, move uh, the uh, date of approval out a little bit more as well. So I would hope everybody that, uh, that everybody would support this and uh, just give all of us more time to consider some potential options and certainly give the public more of an opportunity to, to, uh, uh, to comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So uh, before I go on, so I just want to confirm both with Ms. Kennedy and Ms. Allard, uh, if the two of you are okay with changing this uh, from a motion to postpone to March 23rd to a motion to continue the public hearing to March 23rd. Yes. Thank you. So, so the clerk advises me that the motion needs to be to reopen and continue the public hearing to the meeting of March 23rd. Um, so Ms. Kennedy, are you okay with that motion as the new motion? Yes. Do you want me to state that? But yes, I would move to reopen public hearing and continue that till March through to the March 23rd, <clears throat> excuse me, regular assembly meeting. Thank I'll, you. I'll second it. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so we'll continue discussion on this new motion. Um, so Ms. LaFrance on the motion to uh, reopen and continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Uh, could we hear from someone from the school district on the proposed motion to continue the public hearing? Sure. To March uh, 23rd. Go ahead, if you can introduce Hi. yourself, please. Thank you, I'm Andrew Aleph. I'm the Director of the Office of Management and Budget for the school district. Um, if we were to postpone it for two weeks, that really wouldn't change our process much. You know, typically we have had the two hearings. We have an introduction and then the hearing for the last, since I've been doing this job. So this is really kind of what we are expecting if we do choose to postpone it. Thank you. Okay, Did you great. Thank you, Mr. Ratliff. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Presbridia, on the motion to reopen and continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd just like to hear from the school district in terms of uh, sort of their amount of public input that they've had on this budget and how that's compared to pre previous years. Sure, through the chair. Um, yeah, this year our public comment has been very, very limited through, through private years or past years. Uh, certainly echo Ms. Kennedy's comments that typically we used to have, you know, hundreds of folks coming up and testifying about these budgets, but we had very, very few. And we did have two, me two uh, school board meetings that the public had uh, a chance to comment and also work sessions and uh, finance committee meetings where we did have uh, discuss our budget. M Mr. Chair, can I follow up? Go ahead. So this, so I'm understanding it, you had two school board meetings where the budget was discussed, where there was opportunity for the public to come forward. And then you said you had a work session and a finance committee meeting, all that um, had the opportunity for public comment. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. OK. Thank you. So um, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just submit that, that you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a lot of opportunity for the public to engage in this, in this, this conversation um, with the addition of the the, the, the work session that we, we held, uh, or the meeting we had with the, with the uh, school district, as well as the meeting tonight. So um, that, it seems like a, a lot of opportunity for the public to engage in this um, conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Peterson on the motion before us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I think that uh, possibly one of the reasons we're not getting more testifiers tonight is because we're right in the middle of spring break. And uh, there has been an increase of people traveling, so maybe they're not available to testify tonight. And maybe they will be back in town two weeks from now on the 23rd. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton on the motion before us. Well, thanks. You know, I don't mind putting this off um, for another couple of weeks. But, you know, just to be clear to any public listening, our role in this budget is actually quite small. We can not go in and change any of the details within it. We can only thumbs up or thumbs down it. And if we thumbs up it, then they move on and they operate under the budget. If we give it a thumbs down, 
then they can also go on and operate under that budget. So we can have a public hearing and we're educated and public gets to tell us things, but there's really very little we can do to change this no matter what. So, um, you know, if people want to talk about it on the 23rd, that's fine. I'm okay with that, but there's not a huge benefit either on postponing it. Our role is very small. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Allard? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add to what um, Mr. Weddleton said. The community has been really fired up about the school district. And if they really wanted to be here, they would be here tonight. Regardless of, I don't think there's that many, no offense, Mr. Peterson, I, I don't think there's that many people traveling right now because of COVID. Um, and so I really think if there was, if this was really a hot topic, like Mr. Weddleton said, we're either up or a thumbs down, they would call in and they would be here in front of us. We've seen it all year. So um, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to reopen and continue the public hearing to March 23rd. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Waddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? No. That motion is approved nine to one. Now, as I understand it, because we did do the S version, that we do need to do the, the companion 10G6 item, which is the unnumbered AO uh, 2021 and ordinance approving an amount to be made available from local sources for school bond debt reimbursement for bonds passed prior to 2015. Before we do the motion to introduce, which I think is the only motion that we need, uh, Ms. Alatol, did you want to speak to it? Um, I think we'll just ha we'll take it up with the other item then on the 23rd. Thanks. Okay. So. Okay, so with that, I will entertain a motion to introduce this and set it for a public hearing on March 23rd. Moved to introduce. A second. Second. And is there a third? third? All right, thank you. Okay, so we will have both of these items before us on March 23rd. Next, we have item 14B, resolution number AR 2021-40, a resolution approving a collective bargaining agreement between the municipality of Anchorage and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, local 1547. Public testimony is now open on this item. We'll start on the phone with uh, Ms. Fretwell. Hello? Hi, Ms. Fretwell. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14B, AR number 2021-40. Uh, you have three minutes. Welcome. Hi, thank you for calling. So I am looking over the proposed new um, increases in the CBA agreement for the IBEW. And my question is, why is it only at 1% for the first year and then it jumps to 1.5% in subsequent years? Did you have anything else, Ms. Fretwell? No. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, so as, as you know, we take up uh, questions during deliberations that are asked. So thank Correct. you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Niall Williams. Hello. Hi, Mr. Williams. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14B, AR number 2021-40. You have three minutes. Welcome. Hi. Good evening, Assembly members. Uh, Niall Sherwood-Williams, underrepresented by the newly reporting Cameron perez Verdia in the vacant seat for the acting mayor, Austin Quinn-Davidson. 
Um, in response to 2021-40, the new collective bargaining agreement, it is not the time right now during this uncertain time and um, <clears throat> where you're shutting everything down and reopening it every other week uh, to increase the, the wages for anyone. When the, just like through the chair, um, just like uh, Mr. Eugene Carl Haberman has stated many times, it's not the time to be raising funds, uh, salaries for anyone when people are without jobs. The federal government is working on passing a new unemployment bill of $1.9 trillion to help out those members of the community that you put out of work. So it's not the time to be increasing the wages for anyone. Not the time to be having new collective bargaining agreements. Again, not enough public comment period has happened for this. Any collective bargaining agreement of this substantial of size with impact over the next four years, over a billion dollars in impact, should have at least two public hearings that should be advertised with big yellow letters over City Hall with signs in place of the COVID signs that you put all over the municipality, maybe you should put some new signs about the collective bargaining agreements that are going to punish us financially for generations to come. The municipality is broke. It's time for us to stop playing games with our money. Stop overtaxing us. Reopen all of Anchorage now. And through the chair, Every single member of that assembly body, you're all going to jail. Every last one of you. Point of order is no longer speaking to this item, Mr. Chair. And Thank Mr. you. Chair, additionally, I would add that that's... I will recognize you, Mr. Constant. Thank you. That I, I want to make sure that counts in the process of him being addressed formally. Uh, thank you. So, yes, Mr. Williams, if you could make sure that you're speaking to the item before us. Uh, so your time has continued. Go ahead. All right, um, then that completes our phone testimony. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to in-person. Would anyone like to testify? Welcome. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman. I'm speaking on this uh, collective bargaining agreement that's before you tonight. Number one, um, I keep on saying during this COVID period of time, you've had, and this is an example of it, approving coll collective bargaining agreements. And you had one for the APD, one dealing with fire and so forth. The uh, scenario is the same, as I repeated to you time and time again. When you have people out there that don't know if they're going to have a job, businesses are wanting to stay in business. Although the remarks are coming out from some in our community in this country that we're out of this emergency dealing with COVID, it's over. We can go on dealing with business. I disagree. But what kind of message does it say, send to those in questioning about their future when government? The Anchorage Assembly is respectfully, the administration proposing agreements that increase that benefits and salaries. This is not the time to do it. This is not the time to do it. Now, in respect and understanding Anchorage and the state, in many ways, we have a better financial situation than other parts of the country, like their transportation systems in New York. They're hurting very much how they're gonna come up with the money. They're wondering how they're gonna come up with the money. This is not the time for you to put in and pass and just say, okay, we can handle it. We do not know, and when I say we, Alaskans do not know our future. Even without COVID, we've got a financial crisis in our state before COVID even hit us with billions of dollars of deficit year after year. And what I continue on seeing, whether it's in Anchorage or the Valley, 
a policy of indifference to the situation, our physical shape of our state, even without COVID appearing. We need to send a message that we care of those who are wondering if they're going to have employment tomorrow, they're going to be in business tomorrow. And you continue, when I bring this up, a message where we're going to prove this. But also a footnote this, on these contracts, there should be two public hearings. There should be two public hearings so people can connect. And I'd like to close this respectfully, Chair. There was a statement basically saying that, well, who the public is happy, you know, they'll be here. Well, for you all, please go to the last Anchorage Assembly meeting regular and go with my comments of persons to be heard. And I said, there's reasons why they're not in this room and the reasons why they're not calling many who are really care about the future of our community and our state. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Hello, I am Scott Sikinga. Um, I'll keep it quick. Um, I agree with the other testimonies. Um, it's one thing, we gotta keep the lights on, we gotta keep things running. I understand that um, that makes sense, but to, to have increases at this time when um, there are people that, that don't, if anything, there may be even, uh, maybe even be appropriate to have decreases. Um, it seems kind of odd to me to have um, people up here who aren't in a situation where they're wondering if they have a job tomorrow, making a decision to get raises. Um, whereas the, you know, us just sheep out there, um, you know, don't get that option. So if, if you guys could please just consider, I understand we gotta keep things up, up and running, but every single time it comes up for, an, for increases, it doesn't really make sense, so I gotta speak up. Um, on that, and I, I say this all, in all respect to you guys. I know you guys work hard. I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to be riled up or anything like that. But um, this is not really a time for raises. Let's let's get the budget under control. Let's balance this thing. Let's make it profitable. Let's make Anchorage um, a desirable place for all demographics, and uh, um, I think a financial on a financial uh, perspective. Um, this does not make sense. So um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Actually, I have a question for you, sir, from Ms. Allard. Hi. Um, yeah. I, it's kind of more of a little bit of a statement, but you can respond also. Yeah. But um, this contract is underway. What I mean by that is that we do it for years out, so I believe it's until 2024. Okay. Um, these are Alaskans, too. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if these local workers, I don't know if their wife has lost a job. Mm -hmm. I don't know if their parents have and they're supporting additional family members, mm -hmm. but I would encourage people to understand that they need to get paid too. And yeah. it's part uh, of the process. Um, and I just want to support everybody, but even if this goes through, it's not going to affect how we're helping the community. Just, just And that's so why know. I had the preamble of, if this right. is just normal operations, that makes sense. But um, I, you got to kind of understand the public is a little bit trepidatious about things that are going across the line. Um, and so if this is just operations going, let's go, let's go for it. But if, if we're talking about a raise here at this time, that seems pretty inappropriate. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> Welcome. Hi, Rachel Colvard. So I'm putting my carpenter hat on. Uh, I'm not a member of IBEW, but I've worked with plenty of them. And what the public doesn't really maybe understand is that you have rate of inflation of about three to 5% a year, depending on whether it's a mediocre year or a bad year. So to get a raise of a one or a 1.5%, it's actually a reduction in wages over time. So they have agreed to this. They've done many hours of contract negotiation to make sure that it's fair to everybody. There's a recognition that, um, you know, we are in the situation that we are, but we also need to at least keep trying, keep pace with the, the wages that they do have and not lose too much buying power. So um, I'm in support of uh, passing the agreement to the collective bargaining agreement. Thank you for your testimony. 
Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved, Moved to approve. approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on this item? Ms. Kennedy? Mr. Chair, um, I have, I guess I have a question, and it has to do more with process than anything. And um, that is in regard to the um, information that says by code, uh, the negotiation process requires a 28-day public comment period. Uh, it was introduced on February 9th, but within that 20 days, there hasn't been one opportunity for public commenting, at least not in a public hearing, hearing type of forum uh, until today. So, so how is the 28-day commenting period requirement being met when today is actually the first day for any public hearing opportunity? So, so I'd like some clarification on when the public commenting opportunity required by code actually begins. Thank you. Uh, I will invite someone from the administration to respond. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Kennedy, I'm going to ask if uh, Ms. Uh, Raylene Griffin is on the phone or maybe um, Kate from our legal counsel. Through the chair, this is Raylene Griffith. I'm going to ask for Kate Vogel's assistance on this one. As far as I'm aware, this has been our standard practice and process for any um, items that we pass in changing collective bargaining agreements. Through the chair, this is uh, Kate Vogel, a municipal attorney. I agree that um, I, I've sort of inherited this practice as uh, the way that we've interpreted code, um, but uh, certainly invite uh, Mr. Gates to uh, chime in if he has any thoughts on this. Thank you. Um, so I see Mr. Weddleton in the queue. Mr. Weddleton, did you want to address this point or make a different comment? Not address this point. It's an interesting okay. point. Um, you know, I, what it is, is this, this was noticed um, with at least 28 days before our decision. But, you know, public comment is not the, the three minutes in front of us. That is one somewhat useful opportunity for the public to tell us what they think, but vastly more powerful is to email us or call us or organize through community councils or, you know, take advantage of any number of other ways to uh, communicate with us. So if the focus is there was, there was only one chance to do these little three-minute segments of talking to us, then, you know, maybe there's a point, but, you know, they've had over 30 days to, that you know, people in general to... Um, let us know what they think, you know, through the many ways that are available to comment to us. So, you know, I, th I think this is a, you know, given what we deal with here has been a good routine that is worthwhile. Thanks. Thank you. And before I go back to you, Ms. Kennedy, I do have one additional response myself. And um, so the, the way that I see this, and I would, of course, say it's legal to, to back up this interpretation, but the way that I understand this is that it is very similar to the uh, public comment periods for, let's say, a planning and zoning commission appointment, where um, there is a certain amount of uh, time set aside for the public to weigh in, but we don't actually have a public hearing on that uh, item. Uh, they aren't necessarily public hearing items, but they are items in which they have a public um, comment period. So I think there's a there's a little bit of a of a difference and a nuance there. Um, so I think that's that's what the code intends for this, where there is a 28 days for members of the public to weigh in, but there aren't necessarily official public hearings, except for of course what we're doing, what we just finished a few minutes ago. Um, did you have anything uh, further, Miss Kennedy? Through the chair, this is Kate uh, I don't Vogel. I was there's somebody else that's one. chiming in, so maybe let that person comment. And then, yes, I, w I do have some more uh, to talk about. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so go ahead, whoever that was. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so this is Kate Vogel. Sorry, the extra time gave me a moment to uh, pull up the actual uh, code provision. So the uh, I essentially agree with uh, Assembly Member Weddleton and um, uh, your comment, uh, Chair Rivera. The assembly shall have a 28-day period for public review and comment on the labor agreement 
terms and conditions. So that's the phrase that uh, that I was just reading. It's a quote from the uh, municipal code, and so it's public review, and and so it I, it's it's really talking about that notice and. Uh, is is it publicly available as opposed to it just being um, uh, a purely uh, speaking to public hearings? And we do have other examples in code where it talks about a requirement for multiple uh, times of having public hearings, like our budget review process in the fall, whereas this is different wording, 28-day period for public review and comment, and that seems to be fulfilled by having that notice set further out. Mr. Chair, quick point of information. Uh, sure. So before we get to you, Ms. Uh, back to you, Ms. Kennedy, Mr. Constant. This item was introduced on February the 9th, um, approximately 30 days ago, 31 days ago. And so I believe that that's where the code is meeting the rubber meets the road. So it has been on our system for over 28 days. Thank you. All right. Back to you, Ms. Kennedy. Well, thanks, Mr. Chair. Well. Actually, February 9th was 28 days ago, um, but um, I'm not, you know, try not, try, I'm not trying to argue that point. But, you know, I guess it just brings up for me just this concept, uh, you know, this idea of how this is being interpreted. And I absolutely understand, you know, that this has kind of been the traditional way of interpreting this. But, um, but it does make me question, uh, particularly since that entire section of the introduced items are not necessarily um, uh, recognized by the uh, by the um, com community as being those items by which people uh, have a comment period available to them. Uh, a lot of people absolutely wait to see it be actually be listed on the new public hearing section, you know, the section 14, like we're we're on right now. So I would think that you know one interpretation could certainly be that the commenting period actually starts when we begin to comment on it, and uh, which would be now. So um, you know, and I'm not really going to argue the point, but I, I think it might be something that maybe we would want to clarify a little bit better. I also think that because it is such a kind of a major part of some of the uh, actions that we do as a body, that it would be worth uh, having uh, two public hearings on something like this. Um, particularly with the idea of making sure that the public is aware of what's really before us as well as what they are being invited to comment on. So um, anyway, uh, to me it's an interesting question and obviously it's come down to an interpretation over the years that says, no, we just have one public hearing and it's at the end of a 28-day commenting period that at some point um, hopefully was noticed enough that the public actually sees and understands it. Um, but again, uh, I'm, I'm not going to oppose this. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the main motion to approve. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presbridia? Yes. That item is approved 10 to 0. Next, we have item 14C, ordinance number AO 2021-20, an ordinance amending the zoning map and approving the rezoning of approximately 5.59 acres of land from R4 to B3SO for Northern Light Subdivision Block 6, lots 2 through 11, and Northern Light Subdivision Block 9, lots 7 through 12, for, from B3 to B3SL, for Northern Light Subdivision Block 9, lots 1 through 6, and from R4 to R4SL, for Northern Light Subdivision Block 10, lots 1 through 12. Mr. Generally, Chair? Uh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, you can finish reading. Before you proceed to the public hearing, I need to disclose. And let me finish reading it. Yep. Uh, generally located east of Arctic Boulevard, with uh, south of Benson Boulevard, uh, west of Chicago Street, and north of West 31st Avenue in Anchorage. Um, before we open the public hearing, Mr. Constant. Thank you. Uh, in an abundance of caution, um, I, I don't see a conflict, but I want to make a declaration of the potential and let it uh, be heard and uh, put it out there. So um, my employer owns properties 
not directly adjacent, but one that's two lots away or three lots, depending how you count it, and one that's five lots away from the boundaries of this zoning uh, rezoning project. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, ask the normal series of questions and then we'll make a ruling. Uh, is the financial or private interest a substantial part of the matter under consideration? No. Does the financial or private interest vary directly and substantially with the outcome of the official action? It doesn't exist, so no. Is the financial or private interest significant monetarily? Nope. Is the financial or private interest a type which is generally possessed by the public or a large class of persons to which the elected official or household member belongs? If such an interest exists, it would be any property owner within the same distance outside of the boundaries of the project. So there is a class of people more than a small group. Okay. Um, so considering all of those factors, I will rule that you do not have a conflict. Thank you. Okay, so public hearing is now open on this item. We'll start with the phone, starting with uh, Ms. Fretwell. Hello? Hi, Ms. Fretwell. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for item 14C, AO 2021-20. You have three minutes. Welcome. Hi, my name is Kathy Fretwell for the record, and I oppose this, the rezoning, because if I'm not mistaken, there is a trailer park there. Where are those families going to go? Um, unless they're somebody like me who lives well below their means just to save money, they cannot afford to up and move their trailer homes if, in fact, they do own them. So, I mean, is there going to be any compensation to these families that have lived in that trailer court for several years. Um, to me, that is a big concern considering these are, t they tend to be lower income homes. So what is the municipality prepared to do to help these people if you do in fact rezone this area? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll move on to Mr. Williams. Hi, Mr. Williams. This is Felix Rivera. We are on public testimony for item 14C, AO 2021-20. You have three minutes. Welcome. Uh, yes, thank you, Assembly members. Niall Williams here, underrepresented by the newly present Cameron Perez Verdia and the vacant seat for Acting Mayor Austin Quinn Davidson. In response to AO 2021-20, this is a very interesting move you're trying to make here um, through the chair, Assemblymember Constant. We're looking to destroy the homes of 32 people, 32 families here, which if you figure on the average, there's about 2.5 to 3 people per home. That's roughly about 100 people that you're going to make homeless. Nothing in here states that you're going to financially uh, pay these people. Typically what happens when there's an element of eminent domain is you steal the individual's property and then later, way down the line, you reimburse them at an extremely low cost. This is unacceptable. You're stealing people's homes and uh, through the chair, members of the assembly, these two companies, Greenland LLC and Bering LLC, who are steamboating this project right here, we have information that Christopher Constant, through the chair, is actually one of the owners of these companies. So the financial disclosure that through the chair, Mr. Constant, just went through with, through the chair, Felix Rivera, was not a full disclosure. More investigations need to be done. Another thing, Greenland LLC and Bering LLC our shell companies out of Nevada, why aren't we allowing for local companies to be able to do this? Why is there not something that immediately new affordable housing needs to be built on this land? What are you doing with the land? 
Oh, and another thing that I learned from the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting on December 7th of 2020 is that underneath this land, there's a whole lot of gas pipes and disgusting environmental waste that will need to be dredged up out of here that you haven't talked about. It's going to be an environmental nuclear bomb that you're launching on, this, on the location of Arctic and Benton. This needs to be postponed indefinitely. We need to have companies that are out of Anchorage and Alaska doing the work. Through the chair, financial disclosures need to be done a little bit more with prying eyes. And Mr. Constant, through the chair, should be looking Point at you when he answers the question. This thank is you. inappropriate. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Um, seeing as your, your time is up, I'm going to go ahead and end your testimony, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Constant. A, a false statement was made on the record here about any claim of ownership of any corporation or portion of any corporation related to this project. So that person, I'm not sure where they're getting their fake news, but it's fake news. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and continue the public hearing uh, for in-person testimony. Would anyone like to testify? Welcome. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman. Um, this item is before you, I believe it was last week. There was a work session on it, I believe it was last week. And I connected with that where the public cannot speak, but I could, the public could listen. And I heard comments from the administration and so forth dealing with this issue. I don't know how many CMA members were present and listened to that. But um, when I heard the words trailer court, it rang a bell back in the 70s dealing with Northway Mall when the uh, trailer, trailer, uh, trailers were removed, many of those people you know, limited income to be able to deal with housing. Uh, they built Northway Mall. That's an example that now, well, how many years later, this is an issue of, and I'm glad the first person that spoke uh, rang a bell dealing with that, and I was listening to the um, work session. Now, what is not, was not stated here clearly, because if you listen to the work session, the administration was stating a case that they need to uh, do a major deal and clean up uh, infrastructure, whatever, and uh, how are those people going to live in that area in order for them to do it, and moving it in and out, that creates a situation. And I can understand that, but what I don't understand, and I continue to see it, because we're talking about housing, affordable housing scenarios that should be on your mind too in living anguish with increasing costs. And when you remove these people, and this is the so-called remedy that the administration is proposing to you, and this is what is before you tonight, what's happened is these people have to make another choice. Now, I've heard the words, there was warnings, and is not this, this has been going on for years and years and years. But there's also concern is that this has been going on for years of concern. How come it took so long to go before the assembly on this scenario? Why did it wait so long for the public and you to discuss this thing? This should have been addressed years ago and not wait till last minute. And if there was issues there dealing with the utilities or whatever, it should have been dealt with back then and not now in the midst of COVID. And then I'll remind you the last thing we respectfully. Um, I remember those days with uh, Northway Mall and the trailer courts and all that, and there were a lot of people testifying. It was, a, it was a hot issue. It was a real hot issue. I was part of that, addressing that issue involved. But look what's happened here. Who's here to talk about that? And are you hearing anybody from those trailer courts? There are people that are going to be moving out. Are you hearing anything? You're hearing from me but I'm not a participant in that trailer court. Thank you very much, with all due respect. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify on this item?
Welcome. My name is Dennis Vecera. That's V-E-C-E-R-A. Um, I was born and raised in the house located at 3000 Dawson. Uh, I lived there till I was about 20, bought my own place. Um, about 10 years later, I moved back to 3000 Dawson. I'm the current owner and I own property from 30th and Dawson to Chichaco. Um, my concern with the trailer park is that you cannot have these people, you just can't put people on the streets. The one thing I remember growing up, and there's nobody that knows this neighborhood better than me, Plaza 36 was a trailer park where they gave every owner $2,500 to move. You can't move your trailer for $2,500. I remember reading the newspaper. I remember watching the news. I remember talking to people. I remember the mess at Plaza 36. People left their trailers. They left, they didn't have homes. They didn't have places to go. They were worried, where am I gonna move my trailer? You gotta think about these people. You just cannot put people on the streets. They've got to have some kind of plan. And I do know eventually all the trailer parks are probably going to have to go. It would probably be a good thing for that trailer park to go. And I do know for a fact that that trailer park is very contaminated. I do know that ground is highly contaminated. I do know it's on well water. I know a lot of people have to go get their own water. I know the trailer park is a mess. Uh, the people who own it, Debenham Investments or whatever, they have done nothing but wrecked it. The whole neighborhood is just screwed up. It's just a big mess. So whoever takes over those apartments or puts those multiplex, I hope they can maintain it or have a plan in place where they can have maybe fix those people up, make sure they're taken care of. You cannot put people on the streets. I talk to those people. I'm friendly. I'm nice. I go out there and I help them, I help them build something. They don't have money to fix a porch. I, I help them. I talk to them. They're good people. They're good people. You just can't put people on the streets. You just can't do it. You just can't do it. And I do know eventually, like I said, those trailer parks are going to have to go, but you got to have a plan in place. There's got to be some long-term thinking. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I actually have a question for you, sir, yes. from Ms. Allard. Thank you. Have you talked to any of the people in the trailer parks specifically mm -hmm. about do they know that this is happening? You know, a lot of people, they don't know. A lot of these people are not educated. A lot of these people uh, uh, don't speak English very well. Um, they don't understand. They don't. These people don't. And I'm going to be their advocate. I'm going to be their voice um, for these people. Um, you just can't put them on the street. Do you live in, you, so you live in this I, I, neighbor? I do. I do. Um, if I you live, can make sure you're speaking I, in the mic. I yeah, live on thanks. the corner of uh, 30th and Dawson, 3000 Dawson. It's a big brown house. I own the two lots behind me. It's well maintained. Born and raised in that house, I'll, I'll be there for the rest of my life. But let me tell you something, my neighborhood has gone downhill. Uh, I do know for a fact in 2002 there was a plan between Debenham Investments and Irwin to redo everything. They didn't get their way. They turned all those houses into Section 8, which is okay, but the thing is, it's just, it got lots of drugs and it got, it got pretty bad. But it just needs to be cleaned up. But my argument is I'm just, I'm here for the people. Um, I'm for the people. You can't put them on the street. Um, have you been to the community council meetings or spoken to your assembly members about this? I went to one this? meeting earlier at um, the Shenega Corporation during the summertime. But because of COVID, um, no. And I'm a retired school teacher. So, I mean, I've got plenty of time to go. There's no excuse, but... Um, my, my goal is to be an advocate for those people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. <clears throat> Rachel Colvard. I guess my concern about this would be if we're trying to mitigate our homelessness issue in Anchorage and make it a brief one-time thing, that we need affordable housing and... Um, I've lived in a trailer before. When I first moved here in 1999, you could get a trailer for like 20 to 30,000. Now, if you're looking at the two parks in town that are gonna be the long-term ones, Diamond Estates, you're looking at 
Minimum sixty seventy five thousand up to one hundred and hundred and twenty thousand for some yeah for some of those trailers that are in there um, that are on the market and I think you're just you can't get rid of poor people they're still going to be here and they need affordable housing you're absolutely correct on that and I guess my concern would be if you remove the affordable housing where are they going to go there aren't that many options in Anchorage that are that are left for you know, that, that first step of purchasing your own living arrangements versus renting, um, it's, it's not very sustainable. So I would greatly urge you to rework this, look at some different options. Um, people need that stepping stone to, to get into housing, to build equity, to buy something better, to rent that out. You know, there's a whole process to that. I know you guys know that. Um, that that's just my concern about that type of housing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. All right, so we have a few amendments to go through. Um, so we have uh, Weddleton Amendment number one. Is there a motion? Move Weddleton Amendment number one. Second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Weddleton, you want to speak to it? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is just to bring in findings um, to our decision and it does initially just brings in the findings from the Planning and Zoning Commission and makes clear that we're bringing those in. And then the numbers two, three, and four are um, kind of to cover a concern that, you know, this um, rezone does not crisply match what is in the new um, land use plan, 2040 land use plan, but it meets the, uh, the spirit of it and actually at the end of when it's um, kind of developed as envisioned by the, the proposed zoning with the special limitations, uh, it does meet essentially the goals of the 2040 land use plan. So the, the numbers two, three, and four are just kind of to solidify that stance and, and so we're not setting a precedent that you know there there's some cases where we would have to change the 2040 land use plan as well as do the rezone and we've seen that a um, couple of times now so anyway so that's what those are for I, I would like to modify this amendment slightly so um, offer and um, amend the amendment and that is in um, the section three proposed number two on the second line delete the words no less than so that this number two would read the SL requiring the new R4 SL zone be developed at no less than 32 DOA will result in approximately 64 housing units to replace and then continuing. Second. Okay, uh, move, moved and seconded. Can you repeat that again? Because I don't think some of us got it. Sure, if you're looking at the amendment, uh, the number two um, would read, the SL requiring the new R4 SL zone be developed at no less than 32 DOA will result in approximately 64 housing units to replace the 66 units that are currently on the properties. Got it, thank you. Uh, did you want to speak to quick, the amendment further? Uh, a little the bit, you know, just the probably on, <laughs> so, so on, on these findings, these are not special limitations. They are just speaking, this is our thoughts on this, and this is why we, you know, should we prove it, this is why we support this rezone. Um, it, 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 when it, but, it, but this has no less than um, 64 houses, and it would not probably be correct because there are possibly roads and easements in there that would make it not um, be a full two acres of development. But the 32 DOA is, is quite dense for Anchorage and should provide um, probably, it won't be an exact match for the number of trailers that are possible there, but would come very close. Thank you. Mr. Constant, did you want to speak to the amendment to the amendment? No, actually, okay. when, when the uh, opportunity arises, I want to ask Mr. Debenham a question. Okay, I, I will keep you on then for the main amendment. Uh, Ms. Zalotel, on the amendment to the amendment? Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think the amendment to the amendment is actually inconsistent with the planning and zoning 
resolution um, because that requires a minimum residential d density of 32 dwelling units per net acre. Net acre. Um, I the not. I'm sorry. The no less than language gets to that minimum requirement set by planning and zoning. By taking out the no less than language gives quite a bit of flexibility. It just says that 64 is an approximate number that we. It's, it feels way more aspirational with the resident the potential loss of residential existing residential being replaced i think it is imperative that we keep that language as firm as possible and not create any kind of wiggle room um, beyond what planning and zoning has designated as the minimum thank you thank you seeing no further discussion mr chair briefly yeah, Mr. Constant. Thank you. On that note, uh, if you look really closely at the language of the amendment, it says no less than 32 dwelling units per net acre. And so I think it, it's redundant, actually, uh, one or the other. So I'm supportive of the amendment. It, I think it gets there either way. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Weddleton. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, and, and I had, uh, if, if Mr. Debenham is available, I had actually intended to have him, um, he, he's seen these amendments and get, um, th there are three of them, and maybe get his response to those. I, I'm not sure that he's on or available, but in um, calling on him as, um, you know, as the uh, petitioner, he also, you know, we could approve this rezone, but only if he accepts it with the special limitations and so on does it happen so it if we could give him if he's available um, a little time to comment on these amendments and then and then actually we had a couple questions from uh people testifying that would be best answered by him so i guess the thank I'm you here would it be up to you to call on him yeah uh, thank you i understand that mr debenham is on the line so mr debenham if you want to speak to this please uh, yes, this is Sean Debenham. Just want to verify that you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, so I'm supportive of all the amendments that's been proposed by Assemblyman uh, Weddleton and Assemblywoman uh, Zolotel. Um I'm fine with those. Uh, I, I was just trying to clarify in the special limitation proposed by the planning department uh, they are recommending thir um, um, 32 dwelling units per net acre and I'm, I'm completely fine with that and I'm also willing and able to answer any questions that you might have about uh, some of the um, questions that you have thank you did you have anything else mr. Weddleton well, yeah, if I could, since, since it came up in public testimony if it's proper to um, ask mr. Debenham to kind of address the situation with, you know, what happens to the people who are living there now. I mean, that that is very important. I mean, do you have plans or process for that? Yeah, I can certainly uh, speak to that. Uh, for the last almost 17 years, both my partner and I, Brent Williams, and myself, Sean Debenham, have been the property manage managers out there at the park. Uh, we know our, our residents there well. Um, we're in constant contact with them. Uh, we don't do third-party property management. We're the actual property managers, so we're very aware of our, of our residents. We, we're aware of the situation that's going on in their lives. Um, this is indeed unfortunate that this park has kind of lived out its useful life and has to move on to kind of its next iteration. Um, we, we recognize that that's not an ideal thing it's not a, a great thing but but it's it, at the end of the day it's it's kind of the reality of this of this park and the situation that it's in um, we continue to work with our residents every one of them is aware of the future of the park of what's happening with the park uh, we've met continually with our residents and explained to them we've got interpreters there to if they if their English isn't their first language we've we've had people there to try to explain to them what's happening um, as um, some of our tenants have expressed desires to leave, we've, we've gone so far to purchase their um, trailers and uh, to compensate them for those trailers, trailers as, as they have moved out. Uh, we've done that with, I, I believe, four or five trailers now. And we'll continue to work with them. Um, 
we won't be removing the, the trailers anytime real soon, but it probably will happen in the next three to five years. And as that approaches closer, we'll, we'll definitely come up with a plan to, um, to remove those trailers in such a way that that uh, works out for, for, for everybody. Because um, we do, we have a relationship with our, our residences. We do, we do care about them um, and we want what's best for them as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunbar, did you have anything else for this amendment to the amendment? I, I wanted to speak, ask a question to Mr. Debenham, actually, if I could. Yeah, uh, I'm fine with that. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Debenham. So the, uh, I think you already answered this, but I wanted to, to put a finer point on it. So what, what percentage or what number of the uh, mobile homes are park-owned versus tenant-owned? Um, and uh, are any of them um, new enough to be moved or do they all fall into that uh, categorization where they basically have to be a total loss for the tenant because they're, you know, were, were installed before, I think it's 1991, I don't remember the exact date, but could you talk a little bit more about, about that and this process? Because I think we all are very concerned about the tenants um, in that park. Uh, you bet, and I can understand that. Um, so all of the trailers are not owned by us. They're owned by our tenants. Um, almost every trailer dates back to the early 60s, and which probably means that they won't be able to be moved. We do have a few trailers that are maybe a little bit newer that could be moved. Um, you know, I'd say maybe, I'm guessing, but maybe 10 to... 15 trailers might be able to be moved. Um, and so we'll kind of work with our tenants as we get closer to when we actually need to move trailers to make the determination of whether or not uh, we're demoing those trailers or if we're helping them move them to other parks. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, seeing no further discussion on the amendment to the amendment, members may proceed to vote. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presbridia? Yes. That amendment to the amendment is approved 9 to 1. Uh, we're, we are now back to the amendment. Uh, Mr. Constant, did you want to speak to it? I just have a question for Mr. Debenham. Go ahead. So, uh, hey there, Mr. Debenham. The first question I was going to have was just answered. Like, what is your plan for mitigating the issues related to people who need new homes, place to move? Uh, the second one is, um, are you aware of me owning any percentage of any of these corporations that you have established? Um, absolutely not. You don't own any percentage of either one of the corporations, Greenland LLC, nor Bering LLC. Or any uh, business just, interests of yours. And, and no, you, I, we have not interacted in any way business-wise. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on Weddleton Amendment Number 1. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presverdia. Yes. That amendment is approved 10 to 0. Next, we have Weddleton Amendment number 2. Is there a motion? I uh, move Weddleton Amendment number 2. Second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Weddleton, do you want to speak to it? Sure. This, this is really just a clarification, and it would uh, replace a figure, uh, Exhibit A of the packet, just to properly label the the three parcels that are to be rezoned. Um, what we had did not show the SL, and that's, those are very critical designations. And you should have a copy of the new Exhibit A. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote on Weddleton Amendment Number 2. Ms. LaFrance. 
Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presverdia? Yes. That amendment is approved 10 to 0. Next, we have Weddleton Amendment number 3. Is there a motion? I move Weddleton Amendment number 3. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Weddleton? Uh, this, this really just clarifies the language. It does not change the intent at all. And this um, actually, uh, the wording comes from the planning department. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote on Weddleton Amendment number three. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presverdia? Mr. Presverdia? Yes. That amendment is approved 10 to 0. Last, we have Zolotel Amendment number 4. Is there a motion? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Zolotel? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, er, these are two whereas clauses to underscore the importance of making sure there's full replacement of the residential units. Frankly, um, remi remembering the wise words of Mr. Weddleton that this entitlement runs with the property, not necessarily the specific development or um, the plans that may be, this is just a rezone, as he would say, it would be my preference, quite frankly, to tie um, construction or occupancy of the commercial spaces to residential units built. However, um, I understand that there is a plan here and not heeding Mr. Weddleton's words and honoring that plan um, and the effort that's gone into um, the redevelopment of this area, um, I'm hoping that this clear language that um, residential units need to be replaced as soon as practicable with all urgency um, will be heated and um, we will be able to um, make sure we have equal number of housing units as soon as absolutely possible. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote on Zolotel Amendment number four. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presverdia? Yes. That amendment is approved 10 to 0. We're now back on the main motion. Uh, is there any discussion? Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to speak on this briefly. Um, this, is, this is in Midtown, not in East Anchorage. Um, and so I don't have the, I'm sure the same, uh, I haven't worked with the neighborhood in the same way that some of my colleagues have. Um, and I have faith that this developer is going to do the right thing as they've laid out here. But I will, again, um, sort of express some of the same concerns that have been expressed here today. Um, there was a very large trailer park that was redeveloped in East Anchorage that's now Creekside uh, near Muldoon and Debar, and it was redeveloped by Cook Inlet Housing Authority, which is an entity, of course, that is very interested in affordable housing and has put a lot of density in there and a lot of new housing units. But one thing that people will tell you that went through that process, and it was before I was on the assembly, is the people that ended up living in those units were not the people that were, for the vast majority of them, not the people that were in those uh, trailer trailers. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One, it's the lag between when the trailers have to be taken out and when the construction is done. And then secondly, it, it is the case that in Anchorage, some of the most affordable housing that we have are these mobile homes um, or prefabricated homes or whatever term you want to use. Um, and so I, I guess I, um, I hope and I trust that the, uh, the developer will work as hard as possible, but I hope also that um, 
if, if, they're, if they have the opportunity, they should speak to Coconut Housing Authority about their experience there. Um, and also continue to work with the municipality because there probably will be a non-zero number of, of folks in, those, uh, in that park that might become either homeless or at least housing insecure. Um, and of course, this is gonna take several years to develop, but um, I wanna thank the people tonight that raised those concerns. And I think we are all thinking about the impact of redeveloping um, these kind of parks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Thank you. And the other side of housing insecurity is housing that is subpar and unlivable and where you have to leave the property to get clean water because there's no water system and the environment is contaminated. And so for me, on the other side of this, I'm really glad to see a proposal that will take a property or a series of properties that haven't been improved in 60 70 years and is going to provide an opportunity to really deep clean that section of the neighborhood and provide for basic water and sewer services to people who live there so that people can live uh, like a modern quality of life and you know this is in my opinion a really positive improvement and i'm also hopeful that that people will be taken care of that we can connect to them through cook and housing and other providers of affordable housing so that the loss isn't the same as it was 20 years ago when they did the project at Creekside and uh, you know all of that. But I think that this is a net positive for the community and the fact that it's cleaning up a mess and providing basic sanitation and living quality, quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, all of this is kind of, uh, is actually quite disturbing to me and um, mostly because I, we're going through this uh, as we speak in a mobile home park in the Chugiak area. And I think you're all familiar with, with what's happened. It's a very similar story where the water infrastructure is so deteriorated and, and potentially contaminated that it doesn't provide a safe source of water for the residents who live here or live there. Uh, the owners have recognized that they don't have the cash on hand or the funding to actually fix it. So it's left the residents in a horrible place. It's left the owners in a horrible place. And, um, and really, uh, everybody suffers from it. Um, the bottom line is that when these people who own their mobile home basically have a relatively inexpensive way to live, they have no way to, to replace that at the same kind of financial um, uh, in the same in the same way that they currently live and what's really frustrating about this is in a lot of cases these people own a home that they live in but there there is no resale value for it there is no way to transfer it to another location they are basically just without they end up more or less walking away from their investment they walk away from their relatively inexpensive home and they will never find anything to replace that at the same amount that they have been paying recently, which is basically um, comes down to uh, rental of the space, the, you know, leasing the land that their mobile home is sitting on top of. So Mr. Dunbar is exactly right in terms of uh, the new developments that uh, are constructed. Probably, I don't know about never, but I would say very rarely end up housing uh, the people who had been displaced. Um, so that's an incredibly unfortunate result, but, it, but it's reality. Uh, we've also had a very large mobile home park that was um, uh, the same thing. It was uh, uh, turned into a um, Cook Inlet housing um, project in downtown Eagle River. Uh, very nice senior living facility and some subsidized uh, housing um, uh, facilities there. But again, no one that was in that trailer park beforehand actually ended up living there uh, once it was constructed. So it is such a lose-lose situation for the people who currently live there. And uh, my understanding, too, is that even to try to remove these mobile homes, if someone were to just walk away from it, uh, I don't know 
if um, Mr. Um, Dibbenham is going to be, uh, uh, you know, trying to have, well, might be in the position of having to remove those on his own. Um, but it is an interesting dilemma if, um, and I don't know if Mr. Debenham is still available, um, but it is a good question in terms of what can the municipality do and, uh, in terms of helping those folks get really get relocated. Uh, how can we help them to recuperate something? Uh, in some cases, like I said, there's, there's even an expense to trying to remove uh, a mobile home that's no longer uh, has the ability to be put on the road and taken to a new location. Um, but my other concern about this is this is kind of the typical way that a lot of our um, mobile home parks are going, and that's quite frightening. Uh, I know of another mobile home park, and I won't say where it is, but I know it's got infrastructure issues as well, and I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, this one kind of going the same route. Uh, in the near future, it's not in my location. It's not in my area. It's, in, it's actually in Anchorage. Um, but again, I think we need kind of to have maybe a bigger and better, uh, broader conversation about this, because we are displacing people. That's all there is to it, and we are either requiring them in some way to find a more expensive place to live, or we are essentially putting them in a position of homelessness, and um, that's a real challenge. Um, obviously, the, you, you can't have people living in areas where they don't have safe water, but uh, at the same time, um, you are taking away a, the, the way that they do currently live now, which uh, apparently they find at least acceptable in their minds. So this is a difficult one. I'm, I'm going to support it. Um, I think what I would like at this point, though, is some clarification. Uh, it seems to me that there is... Uh, a uh, criteria that has to be met on this. Uh, it has to have the position, or they has to have the um, approval within a certain number of days of 51% uh, of the owners of the property within the area. Um, so I'm assuming that all, I, I really didn't notice who all the owners were in all of that property. Property, maybe it's just Mr. Debenham and, and, uh, and his um, partner. Um, but anyway, I uh, would like some clarification on what that 51% of the owner's uh, permission or consent uh, actually uh, amounts to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Debenham, did you want to address that? Uh, yeah, you bet. Uh, I appreciate your, your concern. Um, w again, we, we know our residences. We continue to work with them. They're aware of our time frame. They've been aware of our time frame. We continue to work with them as, as they have desired to leave. Uh, we have started, we have in the past and will continue to work with them to purchase their, their units, uh, their trailers, and then we typically demo them after that. And we've worked with um, a couple of tenants to help them move. Um, and we will continue to do that. Uh, we have the, the funds to be able to do that. Um, our company is financially sound, um, and we can we can certainly work with them, and we can also clean up the environmental contamination that's out there. Uh, just would like to note that it, the environmental contamination is definitely not a nuclear bomb. It's, it's a very um, doable contamination remediation that we need to do. And then second, uh, the water out there currently is fine. It continues to get be tested on a continual basis. There's, there's no concern about the water or anything like that for our tenants in the sewer system. Uh, however, what has happened is both the water and the sewer systems continue to fail on a continual basis, and the DEC is requiring us to rip out all the, all the water system, the sewer system, and put a completely new one in. But as it stands, it, 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 is, it is safe. Uh, we do test it continually, and, and we are looking out for our, our, our residents. Uh, but uh, may I, Mr. Chair? Go ahead, Ms. Kennedy. Uh, but Mr. Debenham, you are the owner of all three of those parcels. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. Uh, all both Bering LLC and Greenland LLC are owned by Debenham Family LLC. 
of which I am one partner with my with my family, with my siblings of Debenham Family LLC. So yes, we we own all all the parcels. Okay, thank you. And and just for purposes of information, especially in dealing with the the uh, park that I'm dealing with in Chugiak, um, can you give me a price range on what it costs to actually move uh, a a uh, a unit that's actually capable of being moved, and also uh, what cost for demolition, hauling it off to some kind of, um, I don't know, j junkyard parts, uh, landfill, I'm not sure what all that entails, but can you give me an idea of, of more about what that, what that does entail and the cost? Thanks. Sure. Um, so uh, to demo a trailer and then to remove it costs between ten dollars to $15,000 a trailer. And then to move a trailer is about the same cost. And then once the trailer gets to its new spot, uh, it depends on the trailer's age, how much upgrades the trailer will need to meet the requirements, um, the city requirements for being in a new park. Wow, thank you. That's about six times the cost that I had heard. So thank you for the information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the main motion to approve. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. That item is approved 10 to 0. Next, we have uh, item 14D, ordinance number AO 2021-26, an ordinance amending Anchorage Municipal Code section 21.05.070D to change the use-specific standards for large animal facility to remove outdated language requiring approval from a non-regulatory agency and to add language referencing and appropriating uh, the appropriate agency for the management of animal waste. Public testimony is now open on this item. Let's start with our phone. Uh, starting with Ms. Fretwell. Hello? Hi, Ms. Fretwell. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14D, AO 2021-26. Uh, you have three minutes. Welcome. Hi, my name is Cassie Fretwell, for the record. Nice I'm underrepresented you. by Karen Presvardia and the empty chair. I am opposed to changing any sort of language right now. Um, I think that people need, there needs to be more people involved in whatever is going on in the city, not just designated to one monopoly. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next we'll go to Mr. Williams. Hi, Mr. Williams. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14D, AO 2021-26. Before I start your time, I just really want to encourage you, Mr. Williams, to ensure that, uh, one, your testimony is on topic, and that, two... Oh, yes. It's uh, always on your, topic, Felix. Thank uh, you. Excuse me, Mr. Williams. I'm speaking. Uh, so that, one, your testimony is on topic, and that, two, you do not engage in personal attacks. Um, these are rules that we ask all members of the public to follow, and I really want to urge you to do so. Uh, so go ahead. Your time has started. Three minutes. Welcome. Well, once again, all my comments are always directed through the chair, as is dictated in Robert's Rules of Order. My name is Niall Sherwood-Williams, underrepresented by the newly present Cameron, Cameron Perez-Verdia, and the vacant seat left open, unfilled, by the acting mayor, Austin Quinn Davidson. I would like to speak to the usurpation of power that exists on this Anchorage Assembly body. You have a member of the executive, it says on this document here, right on page one, submitted by chair of the assembly at the request of the acting mayor. 
the acting mayor should not be putting forth legislation. That is a conflict of interest. It's a usurpation Mr. of power. Mr. Williams, uh, th this is not uh, germane to the topic before us. So yes, it is, Felix. Uh, Felix, uh, no, Mr. Felix, Williams, it is not. Felix, so I'm going to go ahead and Felix. end your testimony. Thank you. All right. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing, no one. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Sorry. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Waddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presbyteria? Yes. That item is approved 10 to 0. Next, we have item 14E, ordinance number AO 2021-28. An ordinance of the Anchorage Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code Title II to clarify recognition of the Assembly as a legislative branch of our municipal government. Public testimony is now open on this item. I'll start with our phone list, starting with Ms. Fretwell. Hello? Hi, Ms. Fretwell. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for item uh, 14E, AO 2021-28. You have three minutes. Welcome. Okay. Hi, my name is Kathy Fretwell, for the record, and I am opposed to changing anything in our charter right now. I think first you must learn how to follow it. Secondly, it looks like we have an acting mayor who is in the executive branch, but she's supposed to be in... Seat E of the legislative branch? How is that, how does that even work? I mean, I think you need to learn how to follow the charter before you try to start amending things. Thank you. Thank you. I will go ahead and give Mr. Williams one more opportunity. This is his last item he has signed up for, so might as well try. Hello. Hi, Mr. Williams. This is Felix Rivera. We're going to give it one more shot. Um, we are on public testimony for item 14E, AO 2021-28. You have three minutes. Welcome. Yes, I do apologize for before my phone was hacked by the Chinese Communist government. Uh, Niall Sherwood-Williams, underrepresented by Cameron perez Verdia, and the vacant seat for the acting mayor, Austin Quinn-Davidson. In response to 2021-28, <clears throat> we are a home rule borough, which means that we the people, we own the rules of what goes on within our municipality. I think it's very interesting. I mean, for the first time, and, and this is a genuine thing, I would like to commend the assembly. I've been coming to meetings since I arrived in Alaska in October of 2019. This is the first time I've ever seen you put in a whereas where you include the Alaska State Constitution. So a round of applause for the assembly. Thank you very much for doing so. It's not the time to be amending our charter or our code. Nothing should be amended. No business should be done until the emergency that you've declared is discontinued. No business is germane to the topics of the assembly until that emergency is over. So unless you're addressing things of the emergency, there's nothing for this assembly body to do. That's all on this topic. Thank you, Chairperson Rivera. Thank you, Assembly. Thank you. That completes our phone testimony. Would anyone in person like to participate? Welcome.
My name is Eugene Carl Haberman. I follow a lot of meetings. You know, it's a point of watchdog. What's here before you, and, and there's basically just a couple pages here, but for the public who didn't read this information, which was very few pages, it's a result of a memorandum coming from the Ombudsman concerned about confusion and reference the assembly as a department, which it's not a department. You are a legislative branch of the municipality of Anchorage. The mayor is the executive branch. That's what we're talking about and the role you play. And the uh, ombudsman in a memorandum a few days before this was introduced for reading was recommending language to make sure that this, you were not referred to as a department. That's a summary of what's before you tonight. But what I would say to you now, with all due respect, is you postpone this indefinitely and kill it. Because it's, I'm not disagreeing with what the Ombudsman had said in his report and his reference. But you need to do a more thorough analysis and discussion with the people and proposal to the people of your role as assembly, as a legislative branch. It's even more critical right now because of what's happened in the past 12 months. With the role that you played as legislative branch in the, in the start of the COVID period, you created legislation and you allowed the administration, the mayor, to have the authority dealing with the mandates. That's your role. And your role is also, you can take that power away because you were the grantor of that power but the result has created a situation of a division that should never have happened. And you have been taken, your, you, your participation was very limited where it was understood that you would provide regular reports on that scenario and that did not happen until you insisted and there was more engagement. So what I'd like to say to you is postpone this indefinitely. Give more thought of this thing. Hear from the people the idea of what the legislative branch is and what the executive branch is. And I'd like to just remind you too, in the borough assembly meetings, the mayor sits as the chair. But as you know, a member of, your, of the assembly sits as the chair. A quite different situation, a quite different type of form of government. And it's time for you to all examine, re-examine yourself and your relationship with the community and administration in the, for the future and postpone this indefinitely. Thank you very much with 12 seconds to spare. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, Weddleton. Uh, Sorry. Sure, I, I will add you in the queue, Mr. Weddleton. Uh, yeah, I'll, start, I'll start with Mr. Constant. Thank you. Um, you know, there's a part of the memo from the ombudsman I would read, if that's okay. Um, he says, over the last 12 years, 12 plus years, I've worked in the executive branch under two mayors, an acting mayor, and for the last eight plus years as ombudsman within the legislative branch. During my time with the municipality, I've been troubled that successive administrations including the Office of Management and Budget and the Human Resources Department have referred to the Assembly Department. That is erroneous and does not reflect what's in code or in the charter. The Assembly is the elected legislative body of the municipality and it's one of the two branches of Anchorage's municipal government as outlined in code and charter. To refer the, to the Assembly as a department is incorrect. Interestingly, if you go into the municipal manager's conference room, there is a series of posters on the wall of all of the logos or seals of the municipality. And I have commented now for two or three years, not recently, but because um, I've been there for a year, but they have these posters set up and the way that they have graphically demonstrated it, the assembly is in the minds of the people who run the executive branch, a department of the municipality. It's clear. And so I think that this, uh, statement is a good first step and I think that it would be wise to have a recalibration of some of the graphics that express the nature of our role and in fact I've had this conversation with the chair when it comes to budget documents and other preparations that it's important for the administration to recognize that we set the policy of this municipality. Thank you. Thank you.
Mr. Rivera. Thank you. Um, so a, a few comments. First is just want to comment on how this ordinance began. And um, it was actually our, our wonderful ombudsman who uh, sparked this in both uh, the vice chair and I uh, to look at addressing this via the ordinance. So if you haven't actually had a chance to read the ombudsman's memo, um, I would take a look at it. It's a really great memo. And for the, for the record, the ombudsman does a lot of great memos and um, has affected a lot of legislation in, as such. Um, then I want to also address the query that get, that's been brought up about 11 members versus 10 members in the current situation that we are on the assembly. Th this ordinance has, has nothing to do with that and that was never a part of the, dis of the discussion around this ordinance. This ordinance was specifically about uh, ensuring that the assembly is no longer seen as a department, which gets to the remainder of my comments. So as, as, a, as many assembly members know, um, as chair, one of my main goals has centered around strengthening the assembly and the work the great employees in our legislative branch do everywhere, every day to benefit the public. This ordinance, I think, is really one small step down that path that we've all been over the last two years, and I would really say you know, it's been much longer than that, that we've been, uh, prior bodies have looked at strengthening the assembly. The charter cl clearly states that there are two branches of government, the legislative branch and the executive branch. Nowhere in the charter does it mention a quote-unquote assembly department. This ordinance is really simple. It asks that municipal code mirror the municipal charter. And to comment on uh, one of the testimonies that we heard, this ordinance does not change charter. Um, and it, it asks that municipal code mirror the municipal charter in stating that the assembly is the legislative branch and leaving that department nomenclature behind. So why is that important? Because words, especially those in law, provide status. And the status of the assembly should not be simply as one department among many. So the assembly per our charter is the legislative branch of government and should be respected as such in our budget, as Mr. Constant brought up, one of the most important policies we pass every year and in our laws. So I urge my colleagues to pass this unanimously. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weddleton? Well, well, thanks. You know, there, there is a little, uh, I support this and really appreciate it, um, but there is a little irony, as Mr. Uh, Haberman pointed out, that it's during the time where we've kind of given away um, a substantial amount of our legislative power during this pandemic through the emergency proclamation. But, um, you know, you, this is important, and it's something I never thought about and popped up from the ombudsman. And, but it, it does make a difference. You know, we are a branch. We're not a department. And I would just take an opportunity to praise our chair um, because this is uh, something that clearly has been a theme of yours and I think is very important that the assembly be elevated and given more resources to um, do the job of legislating. And I think we um, have done better and will do better um, because of the changes that you've done. So thank you for that. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presvardia? Yes. That item is approved 10 to 0. The next items on the agenda involve applications for a liquor or marijuana license and or a special land use permit for alcohol or marijuana. The process to review these items is different than the Assembly's legislative role because these are administrative or quasi-judicial hearings and require the Assembly to be impartial, refrain from ex parte communications, accept in liquor license applications, and make a decision based only on the record before us and testimony today. Next, we have item 15A, resolution number AR 2021-70, a resolution approving an amendment to an alcohol special land use permit to add an outdoor patio to beverage dispensary use and license for Northern Hospitality Group, Inc., DBA 49th State Brewing Company reading. in the B2C. Thank you, district. Um, public testimony is now open. We don't have anyone on the phone list. Would anyone in person like to testify? Anyone at all? 
Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved Second. and seconded. Is there any discussion on this item? Mr. Chair. Mr. Constant? You just briefly state that if you had an opportunity this uh, holiday season to go down to see what they did at 49th State, which was an amazing setup in the code environment, uh, this project will fill in that parking area with an outdoor serving space. It's going to be really brilliant. So I urge your support. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presvardia? Yes. That item is approved 10 to 0. Next, we have item 15B, resolution by AR 2021-72, a resolution approving an alcohol special land use permit for retail sales of alcohol with brewery license number 5943 for Brewworks, LLC, DBA Brewworks in the I-1 district. Thank you. Public testimony is not open on this item. We don't have anyone on the phone list. Would anyone in person like to testify? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Ms. LaFrance? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Presvardia? Yes. That item is approved 10 to 0. That completes our regular agenda. Um, next, we are on final audience participation. Uh, as a reminder, if you spoke during the initial audience participation, you cannot speak again during this final audience participation. For audience participation, please, excuse me, direct your comments to the assembly or the chair. You will have three minutes to speak, and personal attacks are not appropriate. In addition, audience members are asked to avoid clapping or other disruptions during audience participation. Last, during audience participation, assembly members generally do not answer questions or respond to comments. We may talk to you offline after the meeting to address any questions you have. I will, as chair, work to maintain decorum at this meeting and ask for your assistance. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and start with the priority list and then if there's anyone um, who isn't on the priority list and would like to speak, uh, I'm gonna welcome them to join us. So uh, first we have uh, Mr. Haberman. Welcome. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman. No, as a set point, I'm a watchdog, attend a lot of meetings. And um, by the way, for a record, I, I arrived in Anchorage September 30th, 1977. That's when I first came. I hitchhiked up here, for some who did not know that. Um, and what I'm going to address is the issue of the relationship of the assembly, administration, and how the municipality of Anchorage has been handling COVID, and most recently, what happened tonight in that issue. The administration has basically, basically lessened, and lessened the restrictions out there for the business and the people in the municipality of Anchorage and people visiting in Anchorage. They've looked at the health situation and they made certain decisions, respectfully. So on the eight o'clock on Monday morning, there was substantially differences in what those restrictions were. But the basis of what the administration was asking for was simply this. You need to wear face coverings. You need to be social distancing. But what we received was concern is that's not gone far enough. Let me remind you, we're still dealing with COVID. Even if you've got a vaccination, one or two or both. The end result is you still can get COVID. You still can infect other people. 
And let me remind you also the history. Many people may have had COVID and may not even realized it. They infected those people. Let me remind you the next door neighbor with over 100,000 people. It's more of a wild, wild west than ever before. And let me say this before the eight o'clock change of orders that happened Monday. I was in Anchorage on Saturday and I was checking out several Walmarts for a particular item. I'm not regularly a Walmart shopper, but what I did notice was, where were the signs? Where were the mask requirements? Where was anything? In the valley, they didn't have signs up there, and they said, oh, the wind blew it away. And a business owner in Anchorage told me on Monday, is, I'm telling you, you don't have to wear a mask. And I'm not saying Walmart said that to me. Huh? You know, a small business owner. But let me also say this, is that in Anchorage right now, there are restaurants old establishment Anchorage in, in, in Anchorage restaurants. They've decided not to open up with people coming in to strictly pick up and delivery because they're not comfortable of bringing people into their restaurant right now, uncertain about the future, and they're taking a more responsibility that I've seen out there because you need leaders. And that's an example of a leader, business saying, looking out for everybody, including their staff. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Williams. Hello. Welcome, Mr. Williams. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on final audience participation. You have three minutes. Hello, this is Niall Sherwood Williams. Represent the nonprofit 1776 Alaska. Also on the website 1776alaska.org. I would first like to speak to the fact that I am underrepresented by Cameron Perez Verdia, who is sometimes there and other times not through the chair, and through the chair the vacated seat by Austin Quinn Davidson. Our assembly body is vested in 11 members, just as you discussed tonight in Anchorage Ordinance 2021-28. It's a legislative branch, which when you're talking about a branch and not just a department of government, when you have an executive, a member of the executive, the acting mayor, usurping power by writing legislation, that's problematic. Another thing through the chair, you should not be dealing with anything before this assembly body other than ending this emergency, dealing with the particular problems that face our municipality on a day-to-day -day basis and working to end the scourge of this emergency. You've done nothing to do so tonight. You passed new collective bargaining agreements. Thank goodness. Thank goodness you pushed forward the budget for the school district, almost a billion dollars, and we only had four people come up and testify. What a disgrace. Anchorites, wake up! to start participating in your local representative government. Another thing, I'm running for school board CD. I'm going to reopen all the schools. Those of you members out there that are listening in the community that have had your children discriminated against because they don't want to wear that E. coli face diaper. By the way, I'm sitting at home, face diaper free right now. I will oppose those members of the teaching staff, administration, assembly body, executive branch, anyone that wants to discriminate against those students that don't want to wear that cloth face diaper that restricts their breathing and their oxygen intake. I will stand up against them. I'll reopen all the schools. I'll give the kids their desk back, their recess time back, their lunch time back. Now, by the way, if you're restricting lunchtime, how does that affect a diabetic person? 
my brother being a type, di type 1 diabetic, if he doesn't eat, that's a major problem. Sorry to interrupt. Another thing, but your time is up. Street. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, next, we have Roger Branson. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I, my name is Roger Branson. I was born here in Anchorage. Uh, currently living in Eagle River. Um, I was just reflecting on the season that we're in right now. And uh, right now we have the um, the dogs are running the Hydatorods out there. That means that we just wrapped up another fur rondi. And um, growing up in Anchorage, the fur rondi came to have a number of different meanings for me. But most recently, as an advocate for homeless folks and, and people with behavioral health issues. Um, I was always challenged by the period from just after the holidays uh, until the Ferrandi. And traditionally, we would lose um, quite a few of our folks during that time period. It was, uh, and um, this last winter was a little bit different. Um, something happened, it was this COVID thing, and the humane response um, that we made ended up helping a lot of the homeless folks, so that I was realizing we didn't have a terrible year that, that we've um, experienced so many times in the past. And um, that was because we'd made a humane response to those, to, to, the, to the pandemic itself. Um, it seems some residents noticed the additional attention and seemed to have taken offense that, that um, maybe some dollars were spent in a way that, um, that um, wasn't the fault of the, of the recipients of the least among us. Um, it was a humane response um, in response to the pandemic. And um, as a result, COVID has um, put forth a silver lining. And I'm just urging that we continue services for the least among us, that the um, efforts we've made towards recovery and rehabilitation and, and, and reentry for so many of these folks um, continues. The uh, huge... Um, significance of the known by name list along with built for zero those efforts that we've kicked off in the last few years um, are all things that deserve our continued um, attention support and this silver lining that uh, came with the COVID money uh, a very small amount of which went to the least amongst us those with substance abuse issues and and the the, the truly um, 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 most challenged of the of the least among us, um, and so I uh, just want to comment on the passing of the season, how different this one is, how glad I am to be at this um, time of year, and um, thank you guys for all your continued efforts. Thank you. I have a question or comment for you from Ms. Zalato. Um, hi, Mr. Branson. Thank you for coming and testifying. I just wanted to thank you for your leadership and your commitment to the work around homelessness, um, particularly in your acting role with the data committee, which data is so important as we navigate these challenging times. So thank you for all the time and effort you put in there. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, we have two more folks left on the uh, priority list. Uh, so next we have Ms. Fretwell. Hello? Hi, Ms. Fretwell. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on final audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Okay. Hi. My name is Cassie Fretwell, for the record. I represent 1776 Alaska, Freedom and Liberty Worldwide. I wanted to touch base with our local anchorites, actually. Um, we are having a court case tomorrow, and if anybody would like to Zoom code or telephonic codes, they are on 1776alaska.org, and that is Alaska spelled out. And also, Ms. Fretwell? Niall, yes, Niall Sherwood-Williams is running for school board CE as in Edward. And he will reopen the schools. He will balance the budget. I mean, he really does care. So I hope that people are listening. And I hope that more people start attending these meetings. They're not that scary. The assembly members are not scary. And sometimes they listen. So come out and have your voice heard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last on the priority list, we have S Scott 
Skukenga. Welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Scott Sikinga. My, my wife uh, teaches, uh, or she taught fifth grade and she explained it. It's a sick king who says, guh, because he's not feeling well. So not that I don't feel well, I feel great. But anyway, um, I, uh, I came to speak on the um, 202175 uh, resolution and uh, didn't really get a chance before <laughs> It was done, so I decided I was, I still want to speak on it. I'm, I'm actually pretty darn opposed to these masks, and I have a, actually kind of a logical process I go through um, to do it. And, and just hear me out, I got a couple minutes. Um, I drive, I, because I didn't have work, I drove DoorDash, and I have to wear the mask to, um, and go to the people that uh, prepare food for these folks that are at home. Um, using DoorDash or other means to get food brought to them and I get to watch firsthand this food prepared by people who are wearing masks with plastic gloves constantly touching their masks constantly touching the, and then the food um, and then I get to deliver it unfortunately to the people that are trying not to go out to uh, <laughs> and they wind up, I'm thinking that the masks actually make the transmission of COVID worse in a lot of cases. And I just, I, I can't believe that, um, that, I mean, there's so much evidence that a virus isn't really slowed down a whole lot by a mask. And um, I'm also, you know, I already had COVID. And so I kind of feel discriminated against. And the fact that um, I'm made to wear a mask when I literally have the cure flowing through my veins, including a larger and larger percentage of people who are getting vaccinated. And I think we need to look at an exit strategy. We need to think about um, ending these, these mandates. There's no mandate saying that you can't choose to wear a mask. Let's, let's choose freedom. And, and you guys had the power to do that and you still will in the future. Please look towards that. I, I would appreciate it. Um, also, um, health, you know, but then you guys go to your health ex expert, you know, and health experts are great, a great tool to be used. But you guys are, are in charge of making the rules, and that's just one factor to be looked into. A health expert is going to tell you every single time that if you don't want to break your leg, don't go skiing. But you still want to go skiing or snowboarding or whatever. A health expert is going to tell you every single time that eating has fast food is going to clot your you know, veins and cause you to get a heart attack every single time. But are you going to be consistent and go ahead and cut off fast food for everybody? Because that kills way more people than COVID. Um, I'm just asking for consistency. It seems like their response to COVID has been um, inappropriate. And thank you. Thank you. All right, that ends our priority list. Uh, would anyone else like to participate? Welcome. Hi, Rachel Kovard. Um, if it's okay, uh, through the chair, if I could know if Dr. Johnston is still online with us. Sure, I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnston, uh, are you still on the line with us? Mr. Chair, she's not. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, what I have is actually uh, something that would probably be better suited for her, but I'll give it to the rest of you right now, and then I'll email it to the rest of you also so that you have the, um, the means to look at it. Um, there's a study that's come out about ivermectin. Ivermectin is um, a well-known intervention that's been used for decades. Um, the generic form would be about $1.45 per person. You can take it prophylactically. Uh, Dr. Tess Laurie, she's an MD and a PhD. She has a background in analysis and synthesizing data. That's why I was asking if Dr. John Dr. Johnston will totally know what is up with this. Um, the website is https colon slash slash COVID, all spelled out, C-O-V-I-D, 19, criticalcare.com, 
COVID19Critical.com, and I'll email this out to everybody. Um, studies show that possible protection against other serious viruses like dengue, Zika, also things like COVID that have very serious effects, um, long-term effects like COVID um, potentially has for people. These studies are showing that there's an 83% reduction in the death rate if we follow these protocols that are listed on that site there, if you scroll down farther on there. Um, even using the, this is where Dr. Johnston would have understood that uh, the very strictest standards in evaluating these studies, these multiple studies that Dr. Lowry looked at, that even if you do the strictest um, criterion, that you still get a 68% reduction in the death rate from COVID. COVID-19 VAX is uh, only authorized under emergency use authorization. And if you follow the Helsinki doctrine, that you would have to give the thing as a treatment that you know is the best course. Ivermectin has um, been studied well over 40 years and closer to 100 years. It is on the WHO uh, list for essential medicines. It's been given over 2 billion times prescribed. In the last 40 years, it has only 4,600 adverse effects and only 16 deaths. Remdesivir is also a treatment being used for COVID-19. And in the last year, it has over 417 deaths. I'll take the 16 deaths over the 417. There is a way out of this. There's, uh, the protocols are listed on that site, and I'll be emailing you shortly. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have a question or comment from Ms. Allard. Hi, Rachel. Thanks for testifying. Um, just a quick comment that Dr. Johnston is not a medical doctor. She She's does have a PhD, though. Yep. Okay. Epidemiology. I just for the clarification. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to participate? Anyone at all? All right. We're going to go ahead and uh, close off final audience participation and move on to assembly comments. Uh, I will start on that side of the dais with uh, Ms. Allard. No comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the good news today was uh, that the threshold for being able to get vaccinated has been eliminated in Alaska. If you're over the age of 16, you can sign up and get vaccinated. So we, we've got... Uh, there were thousands of appointments available online today when I looked. So everybody go sign up and get your shots. I've had mine. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton. Well, thanks. Um, so I'm four time zones away in Raleigh, North Carolina, y'all. And um, it's an interesting trip. I've um, kind of learned it's, uh, we are spoiled in Anchorage. It's really easy to get a test there, and it's really tricky to get one here, but we managed to. Um, homelessness is uh, much less visible here than it is in Anchorage, but their statistics are uh, somewhat comparable to what we have in Anchorage. And I did visit uh, one of their kind of wraparound centers, and I had a tour that was pretty interesting. And uh, it's right next to a shelter that's about the size of Brother Francis, uh, about 240 people there in normal times, but everything's very different, like in Anchorage, because of, uh, uh, you know, COVID. Uh, and it's interesting that, you know, our rezone with the 32 DUA, um, they know how to get some DUAs out of an acre here in Raleigh, or near the downtown. It's uh, very dense, but as you get on the outside, it's kind of typical American sprawl, uh, wide highways and more subdivisions being built out there with more, more malls and so on. So, um, it's been educational, um, so I look forward to getting home. I'll be back uh, midnight tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, good night. <laughs> uh, Ms. Kennedy? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm only two time zones away, so the time difference hasn't been too bad. But um, I did want to clarify just for the record that uh, it was brought to my attention that when I was initially talking about the National Association of Counties, 
counties that I mentioned a uh, wildlife mitigation project, and uh, then I think the second time I mentioned a wildfire mitigation project, and I just wanted to clarify that I wasn't talking about some major hunting program, but uh, talking indeed about wildfire mitigation project. So again, as that uh, working group uh, coalesces and they start to frame their goals and that, I will certainly keep everyone apprised of what our role might be in that conversation. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that clarification, Ms. Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I feel compelled to um, respond to some testimony we just received uh, regarding the drug Ivermectin. Uh, I looked it up while she, the woman was, uh, the member of the public was testifying, uh, Ivermectin is not approved by the FDA for use against COVID-19. It's a common medicine used to tr uh, treat and prevent parasites in animals. There was also a Journal of American Medicine study that found that uh, there was no appreciable difference in the duration of symptoms between people uh, who took Ivermectin versus a placebo. So um, that's information I think is worth knowing. Uh, where there is a huge difference in symptoms is people who have been vaccinated. Uh, the vaccines drop incidence of fatal COVID-19 uh, cases to zero. People, yes, people have caught COVID-19, but not a single person who, have, who has received any of the vaccines has perished uh, after receiving them. It is a miracle medicine. So if you were eligible, and now everyone is, although there still is some limitations to the supply, please go get vaccinated. Get vaccinated immediately. Um, because again, it is how we get through this. It is safe, it is reliable, and it makes COVID-19 a non-fatal disease. So please get vaccinated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Presbyterian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a few items I want to address tonight. One is that, uh, the first one is that I realize many people in the, pub in the, in the public are, are very much opposed to the, the mandates that have been um, put into place. But uh, an ongoing narrative that I have heard and I have been very concerned about, and uh, finally, I think tonight I need to speak to, is the narrative that, that the, the mandates that have been um, put in place in Anchorage are directly correlated with people committing suicide. And as, as somebody who has, my, sis, my sister committed suicide 10 years ago, um, I've had many friends uh, and uh, people I've known in my life who committed suicide. And, and I am very concerned about the use of something that's so tragic and, and, and so too common in this state to be directly correlated with decisions made by this by this body and that and that um, that it's being used as a tool to argue someone's position uh, so I would really encourage the, the, the public and those that, that continue to use that as a narrative to stop because because if you talk to experts that work with suicide um, and work with families who have experienced that you'll know that, that there's no direct correlation certainly there's been a correlation in terms of increased um, stress and mental health issues and a variety of things related to, to, to COVID. Um, and, um, but I want to make sure that I sort of put that on, on the record, that I would really encourage us to stop using suicide as a tool to argue your position. Second, I want to make sure that I'm putting on the record something similar to what um, Mr. Dunbar just said. The vaccines work, and I have um, increasingly heard folks in the, the public talking about them and, and putting forth information that simply is not true. Vaccines work. Masks work. Distancing works. And the reason that we are in the, the position we're in now to be able to begin to ease up is because of the restrictions that are put in place and because of the sacrifice that so many people in Anchorage have, have made. Um, and then the, the last thing, um, that I want to say is just that, that the problem that we're all sort of facing here is not mandates, it's, it's COVID. It is a collective problem that we're all facing. Um, and we don't all agree uh, in terms of how we should fight it and approach it, and, uh, but that's the collective problem that we have. And so I, I, I find that we have more in common than we do um, not in common. And so I'd like to, to, to really encourage the, the public to, to see this as a collective challenge that, that we're all fight, fighting against. 
Uh, and with that, um, I just want to, again, thank my co colleagues and administration for the work that they do, and thank, again, all of the folks that came out tonight to testify in person and over the phone and the, and the hundreds and sometimes thousands of emails that we received uh, from the public. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Thank you. Two items. First, uh, tomorrow will be the concluding activities of my participation in the National League of Cities Conference. Uh, last year, that conference was the last conference to attend before the nation shut down in the Washington, D.C. area. And it was the last time I traveled outside of Anchorage. Tomorrow, via Zoom, I will be meeting with our congressional delegation and having conversations with them about the Port of Alaska, some of our road priorities, and as, as you've heard, they're planning to fund the rescue plan out of a block grant kind of model, where they're sending block grants to the states and to the cities. We're gonna receive direct funding as opposed to having it brokered through the state. Well, there is a move to uh, really strengthen what's called a surface transportation block grant program, which if passed would increase the direct allocation of highway dollars to Anchorage directly in block grant form. And so we may find ourselves in a unique and interesting position and a little more of a position of authority to work with our partners at AMATS because we'll have the funds ourselves. And so, um, and that wouldn't go through the MPO, it would come directly to us. So as I said, that was the last travel I did before COVID shut the country down. And uh, obviously I have a bias. I've served on this body over that time and I have seen us lead in a way that was very difficult through pressure, uh, unbelievable pressure from all directions. And sometimes with a good partner in the state and sometimes not. But today, as we've heard, the vaccinations are now available to any Alaskan 16 years or older who can sign up and get an appointment. And to that end, when I looked at the AnchorageCOVIDVaccine.org site, which is a creation of the municipality through the I-Team, there were 6,700 appointments in the database when the meeting started. And now there are 2,700 in rough numbers. And I want to speak to that I-Team project, who I'm really grateful for, because even though it's AnchorageCOVIDVaccine.org, spelled out, this tool is supporting the entire state of Alaska. Every vaccine that's available right now across the state is in that list, at least not the, on, the, on the public side, not the military side. What that means is Anchorage is once again helping be a bridge to the rest of the state to figure out how to get vaccinated. I had a friend just text me in, in Fairbanks, oh man, they just ran out of all the vaccines in Fairbanks because people are signing up. So people, please sign up. This is the answer to us getting through this. And I personally did have my vaccine second dose late last week and made it through very mild uh, side effects. And I'm grateful to have it. And I welcome and beg and plead for you all to do that yourselves because that's how you be a superhero for this community. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Zalatel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, two things as well. Um, at 10 a.m. tomorrow, I'll be getting my first COVID vaccine along with my husband, um, thanks to South Central Foundation. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, I reiterate all of my colleagues' um, comments about the vaccine, um, and particularly want to emphasize those of uh, Mr. Perez Verdia about masks, social distancing, and vaccines. Three tools at our disposal, three tools that are not terribly inconvenient, quite frankly, and that will, um, as the mayor indicated, uh, let us really enjoy the summer, which we all deserve. The second um, I wanted to highlight, um, I am a broken record for the next two weeks about reaching out to your legislative delegation about school bond debt reimbursement. Um, school bond debt reimbursement for fiscal year 21, which was vetoed by, it was included in the budget from, for the state, vetoed by the governor, will require us um, in the municipality, if it is not backfilled, to raise taxes $110 per $100,000 assessed value to pay that obligation for school bond debt that was previously promised by the state. So it is in the legislature's hands to take action. So please reach out to your legislature, your state rep, 
your state senator and ask them to try to find the money and pass a supplemental budget. Otherwise, um, the residents of Anchorage will pay. Um, so I, I can't underscore that enough. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, that completes assembly comments. So with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, we are adjourned.